All right, folks, are we ready to begin the work session, for City Iowa City City Council work session for January 22nd, 2019? The first item is the fiscal year 2020 budget discussion. Jeff, did you have a list of specific decisions you are aware that we need to make, or are you waiting us for just to toss out specific ideas? Well, we do have one memo in the, in the uh, packet, and that uh, is in response to your request for information on shifting uh, temporary or hourly uh -huh. staff to a permanent uh, status. So there's some cost information that, uh, that you have there and that we can help talk, uh, talk through if you want. Um, the other remaining topic that I'm aware of would be the relocation of the St. Say Gilmore House. So, Mayor, if you want to fill folks in on, on the meeting we had with the university, I'm not sure we're ready to make a decision on that, but we could at least give an update um, on that. Sure. And anything else that, again, the council wants to wants to discuss related to the budget? Okay. I wonder if we could begin with Ashley providing a brief summary of the information that's in the memo okay. you, Ashley, provided us. Of course. <laughs> so, um, council requested a. a exploration of what it would look like if we moved um, some or all part-time hourly employees to uh, a permanent position or a permanent status position. Um, we ran a report and ended up uh, scanning through 355 employees. Um, so they hold a variety of positions. Um, I think a, a greater number of positions than 355. Those were individuals. Um, of, of those, we selected 38 uh, based on the fact that they work at approximately 20 hours per week on average. Um, there are no AFSCME employees, union employees, that currently work uh, less than 20 hours a week, so um, that was our gauge for how to determine what types of positions would be considered. Um, these also hold uh, status as, as positions, uh, responsibilities that are held year-round, so um, they're not seasonal employees that would be hired in to uh, work on recreation programs or park maintenance uh, seasonally, um, working with public works on particular projects over the construction season. These are people who work in our in our facilities and do, do jobs uh, year-round, generally. So they came from different departments. Uh, we have recreation, government buildings, park maintenance. There's a couple in uh, public works and water and engineering. We have several at the senior center. Uh, communications has three positions. And then there are uh, quite a few at the library as well. Uh, so a couple of housing authority, I missed that as well. But um, we took a look at uh, cost analysis. So we started at the very, very minimum amount that an employee coming into the AFSCME union would receive as, as base pay. Um, so a grade one, step one pay to, to do our cost analysis. We added insurance and uh, costs that we take out and pay for FICA and IPERS pension, uh, and then we uh, we also incorporated health insurance and, and dental insurance to see what that cost uh, to the city would be for all 38. So depending on you know whether this would be considered uh, further, we could we would need some direction as to what which of those positions end up in <coughs> status change. Um, we would have to coordinate with the union as well uh, for whatever they consider to be a position that they would want to add to, to their union. So um, I have a couple of other pieces of data, just I'm ready if you have questions. Okay, what, uh, what do our council members have to say? Well, I, one question I would have is, mm -hmm. we, we do have permanent part-time employees Yes. Correct. Yes. What distinguishes this group of 38 positions from those other positions? Is there, s I would think there must be some criteria as to why they would not be considered 
permanent part-time? Well, they hold um, these particular positions were determined uh, just to, to not be part of the bargaining unit based on their their responsibilities and, and tasks that they perform. There's a greater flexibility in what these positions do. Um, operationally, it gives flexibility to um, our departments to determine, you know, how many hours they need a, a pool manager, how many hours they need a um, recreation coordinator. Uh, how many hours we need, you know, various various other services, uh, reception at, at their desks and things. So um, it's just a determination of who's, what the union considers a, a position in their in their group. Yeah, if I could uh, jump in, there's, I don't know if there's a, a clean line that we can give you on where that is. It's it, partly it's hours worked, so a lot of the permanent part time that are incorporated into the union or even non-union, they're going to be 20 or more, whereas a lot of the hourly positions are, are less than 20. Um, we picked the ones that, that work at the higher range for those hourly ones based on what we thought uh, you were looking at. We make determinations on, um, well, I'll give you an example. So a few, a few years ago in our budget, we converted um, a planning position to, it was our historic preservation planner from temporary uh, to permanent. And we did that um, because when you do that, you start to offer benefits to those employees and, and hopefully you don't see as much turnover in those positions. So a lot of the positions here, we expect turnover uh, throughout the, uh, uh, well, I guess more frequent turnover. Um, in those positions, and when we have those permanent positions, we hope to hold on to those employees a little bit longer, so that's one of the rationale, but um, I don't know if there's a, a clean distinction if that's what you're looking for. It's a kind of a case-by-case -case determination. I'll, I'll further clarify. Um, when you look at the list of positions that were identified, there are more than 38 people who hold some of these positions. So, for example, the customer service representative at Recreation, there are 25 people that do that job, and only eight of those positions were determined as, as working in that threshold where we would consider them to be a permanent level position. There may still be a need for an, uh, someone to fill in for that position if there's an absence or uh, just to provide greater flexibility in, in what those tasks are. The complication arises when you have the same person doing a very similar job but having a permanent versus a, a, a temporary hourly status, um, it, it gets complicated. Maz, I know you wanted to say something. Mm -hmm. I want to say a lot saying on this, not only something. First, the analysis shows that the city currently employs 38 people to work an average of 20 hours per week. An average means maybe more, maybe less than 20, which is, uh, and this 20 hours average, it will be consistent year around this schedule. But we are not providing employer <coughs> paid health insurance or dental insurance of this employee. I don't think this good practice by the city. No, we shouldn't do that from the first place. And why do we have so many employees in this situation? This employment status is just away from paying the employer's health insurance and dental insurance. You know, you're just talking about the recreation center and you're saying that there is money position. I'm really looking forward, even especially on the recreation center, for the customer service on the front desk. We have many employees work there. And I understand most of them are student, but uh, I know many people who work there, they still like seeking more hours and because uh, some of them are not students and they would like to have more hours to stay there. And something like the rec center, really we need employment, employees there who really gonna be responsible, dealing with a lot of people. If we, ha we keep changing the person who's sitting there, 
and I don't know, there is some situation happening there, and uh, the staff have to call the police for the people who use the recreation center for no reason, because maybe she's young and she cannot even uh, have a lot, like good training. That's why I really looking forward to have like permanent position for those people so they can be trained well and pay well and have health insurance, most likely they will stay. And all of what the difference between somebody work really as uh, you know, Thomas, Mr. Thomas said, is they work they are more than 20 hours or 20 and above, and they come every day to the work, and they do their job like uh, the right way, and they don't get inf insurance. And there is another person who is part time, permanent work 20 hours also and get insurance. I don't think this is really good practice by the city. The memo says the actual cost may vary, you know, but we need a frame cost to estimate before we can make a decision. And I really encourage ask me to come here and speak on that. Because I remember when we were talking about increasing the, the minimum wage for the employee here, for the city, season on city employee, ask me, one of the ask me representatives said, also I would like to see more permanent job. She emphasized that, and I went yesterday to the, to the video to make sure I remember right. That's why I really encourage them to come over. And as I said again, that's my last thing. Whenever we give people insurance, most likely they're gonna stay on the job. And that's why the city should do it. And we have to set the example. Where the city government here, how can we just go around the law and give those people like 20, uh, 20 hours or more and don't give them, like, give them you know, the health insurance. That's real, I think, like we're sneaking around the law. Thank you. Do we have any information on, on the tenure of these, these staff that we're talking about? Because, uh, and did they leave for a reason? Because I, I know, for example, the young man at the front desk here has just left because he'd finished school, and that was his whole intention of working that job. Uh, then he got a permanent job elsewhere because he'd finished school, so it worked for him. So is there any information on that? or? Uh, we, we don't have tenure information now. Um, oh. And I did want to point out um, uh, real quick that you do have a statement from Ask Me in your late handouts. The mm -hmm. representative couldn't make it tonight, I think, due to the weather complications. But if you look in your late handouts, you can get a sense of what Ask Me's position is on this. So, so uh, my, but I'm I, sorry, I know okay. we don't have that Yeah, but my comment on that would be that I, I think before we made any decision on this, that I, I think you as a staff and someone from council, maybe two, should sit down and meet with Ask Me. And, and they should take a serious look at it, and perhaps there are some of the categories that they, they feel, because I spoke with the AFSU person also, and uh, I know they have some concerns as far as how that's going to affect some some employees, that maybe uh, they'll lose their jobs because of that if you put more in permanent status or they have a different supervisor or something of that nature. So and I think it's something the that The email we, we received points to that as a significant mm -hmm. challenge. Right, we did get a letter from them in the late hand, <clears throat> which I appreciate their, their comments, and I, but I, so I think we really do need to include them in the discussion. Ashley, could you remind us of what the estimated cost sure. would be for converting 38 employees? So if we were to enter every single one of these positions into that first step, which we would anticipate it would end up being somewhere somewhere different within their the FSME pay plan, just based on their position responsibilities. Um, we're looking at an increase in wages of approximately two hundred fifty four thousand four hundred dollars. We would also be looking at an increased benefit pay, so that includes the health insurance and dental for three hundred and sixty seven thousand dollars. So a total would be six hundred and twenty one thousand four hundred dollars for thirty eight positions approximately. Um, you know, if there's a, a change in the number of employees that would um, that would take the health insurance, so if you know fifty percent of them would would end up taking that health insurance. Um, excuse me. It would, it would just vary um, in cost, so the the insurance would drop a little bit, but it would still be in 
you know, several thousand, several hundred thousand dollars for that. And this would be a recur recurring cost. It year would. by year, correct? So this is the this is FY20. Uh, there's no compounding. We didn't go that far out, but it would compound. And we also just to understand this is the difference between bringing those employees up to the the current um, 1150 that that is budgeted this year, plus the additional to bring <coughs> them into the into the union pay plan. Um, one last question. Mm -hmm. uh, if we chose to do this, how would we pay for it? Uh, it, it would be very difficult right now because it's a re recurring cost and we don't have the flexibility to bring in that type of recurring cost right now. So we'd have to float it on reserves for the first year and, and basically when it comes down to next year's budget, we're going to have to do everything we can to, to free up operational costs of, of that amount, and, and we'll have a more precise amount at that time. But um, for, the, for the time being, unless you want to identify cuts in the next couple of weeks to the operating budget, we're not going to have that flexibility. But isn't this going to come from the employee benefit levy? No, you could, you could probably cover some of the costs with the employee benefit levy, but I don't think you could probably cover it all with the... No, I don't mean for this year, because you already, yeah. Uh, but I mean, like next year, like next yeah, budget. 20, yeah, 20. we'd have to look at that. So uh, yeah, in addition, you, you could cut, you can raise, you can raise taxes, you can cut expenses. Um, if you hold things the way they are proposed right now, you're you're looking at using reserves. But if you tell us figure out a way to fund this dollar amount, we're going to have to come back to you with multiple scenarios. What, what I would really like to do is we have this letter from Terry Byers. She's one of the heads of the local AFSCME union, and she has uh, said the following in her uh, comment from January 29th, 2019, the late handouts. It's 9I. It's maddening to see all these hourly jobs when we know there are permanent jobs that could be created or expanded for some tasks. Um, as far as I can tell, the precise issue that we're dealing with is what happens for some of these employees over the course of a period of a number of years that are sort of permanently stuck in this sort of second tier job where they're, they're not able to get the permanent um, part-time position and they're not able to get the benefits when, in effect, they are doing this work over the long time, right? And so I think she raises a very, very good point. Um, and I think to Pauline's point, getting that input, the, the email that we have before us does not give us a sufficient level of detail. It seems like to me this is sort of her, and it's no offense to her, I think she did a great job in response to the proposal, um, but what I would like to see is a, to the extent that AFSCME is interested in doing this, much more detail in terms of specific proposals that they have in terms of switching some of these from part-time uh, to permanent part-time to get their input or potentially some of them to full-time. I think that that is very, uh, that is something we need to take a look at. In terms of this immediate budget year, I don't think we're really ready to make a decision of this magnitude without getting that level of detail. Um, but I would like to hear more from them in terms of a specific proposal that they would have um, to the extent that they would like to. I share your concern. Your concerns, Jim, what, you know, if we're talking about approximately a million dollars, we have some other big ticket items. And I remain committed to increasing the minimum wage, which I understand to $15 an hour, which could be up to a million dollars a year if we expand those for the next three years up to $15 an hour. So I want to make sure that we're able to do that. But I, I want a greater number, uh, amount of detail from AFSCME in terms of what they're thinking. I do think operationally it has hurt us to some degree where we do have certain jobs that should be more permanent, that we have a great deal of turnover. And I think that that has uh, caused some uncertainty in terms of the provision of services. So I think as a long-term goal, we need to do it. In terms of this immediate budget year in the next two weeks, I think it's too complicated a decision to make on this short of notice. So that's sort of where I am at this point. I would agree with you, Rockney. I think one of the things we did was we had a meeting, I believe, back in August where council was asked to bring 
um, ideas to staff in terms of any major budget items so that staff had time to you know put that into the planning for the year and I think something this major needs to be brought in at that point in time where it really gives staff time to think about it in context of the of the big budget for the year so one I, th I think it's late for this big of an amount to be trying to be added for the 2020 budget and secondly I, I would just quote a couple other things from Terry Byer's email um, from the union. And she said, she said, you know, don't get me wrong, I would love to have hundreds of potential new members, but I know this won't be the case. Many of the jobs would be consolidated or eliminated. Another factor that isn't being taken into effect is the number of permanent jobs all over the city that have in their description supervising of hourly employees. Concern that that would go away. Um, I would love to see more permanent employees be full time, but there isn't money for that. So I, I think you know the budget can only stretch so wide. So I think while they very much would like to have more full time, more permanent employees, um, I think they also understand that we have a limited budget, and I don't see how we can move forward with this for the 2020 budget. Yeah, it seemed to me that Terry's email was pretty ambivalent about the specific proposal in front of us. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we could do is, uh, here, here's, here's, here's what I suggest, and I think it's consistent out. with what Rockney just said okay. and what Susan just said. We, we could choose not to do this specific action this year, but instruct the staff to uh, consult with our uh, labor representatives about the list of 38, see if there are specific suggestions about which ones they think would agree uh, are most in need of conversion, something like that. I don't, I don't want to tie your hands, Jeff, here, but uh, something that involves some kind of consultation. Uh, looking forward to the forthcoming budget year, I, I, I personally would not support expending, uh, committing this kind, of, uh, this amount of money for this year's budget when we're this far along into the process. But I, I do think it's worth looking at more carefully. I don't know what the rest but of it is. But Jim, we, I guess, I don't know why not. If we have 2.9 million for the share breast for the, for, for the council fund, which is not gonna affect any another fund, and if we don't give our employees 600,000 out of this share breast fund, this is will go to the reserve. Why we are saving and we are abusing our employees. We are just like make them uh, come here and do everything and not getting like uh, getting like health insurance. You just telling me that we're gonna put like almost two million. We're saving them for facility for emergency, and we, we don't want to give it to those people be just because we we did not like really thought about it in the beginning. I personally would be a lot more persuaded if any employees had approached me and said, we really need for you to do this. Not a single employee They has approached come to, to me. me. Do you they, want me to bring they, some they people here? approached you. Because I deal with you. those kind of people, like normally. I meet with those kind of people. Maybe you are not. But I always meet with those people. And they always tell me, especially the rec center people. And I guess, yeah. I don't know, but I think Boleyn also heard from someone about this. Somebody told me that. You know, somebody told you they need more hours and they need to be, like, get benefit. I don't know. Sometimes people, they don't have to reach out to you. If you, need, you really see something wrong going on, you just have to go ahead and correct it. This is absolutely wrong to be happening by the city. Sometimes even we, we told the, the, the private business not to do this. And we, as a government, we doing this? And why should we save? If you're really passionate about doing it, why should we save money and not giving those people health insurance and benefit? I appreciate your concern, Mazi, here, because that, that is very valid. But I know that it's not intentional on the city's part to have ever done that. Having worked for the university for over 38 years, 
they do the same practice. If you work under so many hours per week, you're considered just part-time or hourly, and you don't receive benefits. So, And they're a very large employer in the community, and they do this very same practice. It'd be way more than 38 employees that would, would, would fall under that category. So, I mean, it's, it's not the city intentionally doing this, but I, I do have a lot of concerns about it. I, I'm also concerned from what I've heard and in, in talking to the union and some of the employees that in this position as, as temporary or hourly, they have a flexibility of hours, and I'm not sure if uh, Ashley would be able to answer to that or Jeff, that if that would go away, if they then were more uh, uh, determined to be permanent uh, or, yeah, permanent or, or not at, at just hourly, they wouldn't have that same flexibility of hours that they have as, as a part time hourly, because uh, that would concern me. But, and so I think I, yes. hearing from all of these that would be affected if indeed, if that's their concern, and, and meeting with, with the uh, union. And th th they should talk to the union if they have these concerns. I think for me is not so much the 621,000 that we can, you know, put in the budget really quickly. I think it's it, it would be done too quickly and it would be done without, you know, considering the individuals that <coughs> jobs could be affected where they could lose their jobs and then we're really need, we really need some time to re-examine those jobs, those positions, are some of them going from 20 to 40? And so I think if we, if we, you know, kind of push this through, um, then you know a lot of people are going to be affected, and we may not be taking into account um, all the um, the things linked to doing something like this. So it's not the money, um, because I think we could find the money. Um, I, I'm, so it's not about the money. It really is about, you know, let us now, you know, talk about how can we work with staff, give them some direction on um, moving this forward, and you know, and and making sure that it's in our budget in the future, if that's where we want to do as a um, majority. I know I'm not going to get support on this, but I'm going to continue talking. And I'm going to ask Jeff a question. You Bruce, mentioned, you texted me that, and you said there is money, 580, mm -hmm. that being put aside for some, for nothing. And can, I, can you tell me about that? Because I really don't know. We have like 500 something, 80 something, we just put it aside without using it. I really don't know anything about that. If you can tell us why that money being put aside. Our general fund has a 1% contingency. That's a pretty standard practice with, with budgets. You, you budget a, a percent um, that is a contingency for unforeseen um, uh, operational costs that come up throughout the year. This is the one, exactly. This is the unseen one, and we just saw it. Why we don't use that money? I think what Jeff's referring to is something like a fire at the landfill. S Anything. Something that really comes completely out of the blue and requires an, a, an expenditure that we were not anticipating at all. What you're asking us to do now is commit the city to roughly $700,000 a year or more into the foreseeable future. That is not responding to a contingency. That's not what a contingency fund is for. What about the $2 million? What two million? Out of the surplus fund that we're going to put it on the reserve. I'm sorry, I don't know what fund you're referring to. That, that's what? the fiscal year 18 surplus. So those yeah. those are dollars that we don't that's anticipate. That's the council dollar. We, we don't anticipate to get those dollars year after year. So I would always caution the city council to use surplus dollars to fund operational. Because when you're hiring an employee, um, you are doing so not with the expectation of one year's worth of employment, but that you can keep that employee permanently. So I would never recommend that you use surplus dollars for, for those types of operational expenses. That's why we focus on things like capital projects or reserves, one-time expenses when we are fortunate to have uh, a surplus like we did in fiscal year 18. I think we have really good reserve. We have almost five, th five, five million for the emergency reserve. We have that 500 somewhere for also this, wherever it come up. And we have also now the two million that we can really use from that facility reserve, which is, I think, this should be done now. And I'm gonna ask you also another question. I, my understanding, all the city benefit and wages, it come from special revenue levies, which is called employee benefit. Am I right or not? I don't know. I'd have to. I'd have to get into Dennis. We'll talk with Dennis. I don't. 
maybe Dennis can come up and answer that. Um, I don't know if we take all wages and benefits out of that employee benefits levy. No, uh, Dennis Bakken said finance director. Uh, there is a levy that can be used for employee benefits. Uh, there is no cap to that levy, but can only be used for employee benefits. Yes. So that, that's what it's limited to. You mean next year, if we say we approve it, and we use any kind of fund for this year 600, but next year, it will come actually from the taxpayer, right? Yeah. Because the levy will be increased by uh, like uh, some kind of percentage, which is going to make additional of $600,000, right? We could increase the employee benefits levy to cover the benefits portion uh -huh. of these employees, and, and we are already to some degree, because um, for what their current wage is, we do levy for some of their FIC and IPERS that are being covered. Uh, we would not be able to use that levy for the additional wages. So if they go from the $11.50 to $17.89 or higher, uh, we would not be able to use that levy for that. It would come from the general fund. We'd have to come from the general fund. Okay. Okay, we have lots of other topics to discuss. I'd, I'd like to see if we can move on. Uh, are there four people in support of what Maza here has recommended? If, if you support, please just say aye, I do, or uh, yes. Okay, so I don't see support for that. Yeah. I, I made an alternative suggestion, which was to not do it this year, but to instruct the staff to look more carefully at this. You want to help me with some language here, Rockney? I, I do. I, I would move to evaluate this proposal pending our next budget review year. So I th presumably that would be um, FY21, where we would have that August discussion. And from this point to that, uh, what I'd like to do is get the consultation with our unions to making sure that we're, we're evaluating this um, holistically with our unions to evaluate this. So I don't know if that's specific yeah, enough that for motion. That language sounds pretty good to me. I just want to make sure we're not literally tying our city manager's hands. Because Consideration. So, so yeah. move to further evaluate the proposal as made by Mazahir, except not this year, the following year in consultation with the union to get more particulars as to the impact on the budget and the staffing levels. This sounds reasonable to me. But it's not, you are not agreeing to do it next year. That would be But correct. you are just want to evaluate it next year. Yes. Yes. Oh, my gosh. For, okay. For evaluate it to see whether exactly. it would be incorporated in next year's budget. I thought because we don't have money this year, that's why we want to do it next year. So it will, we approve it for next year, but we are not approve it for this year. But this is completely not. You, you are thinking for evaluation for next year. Yes. Uh, Jim, one, one thing I might add, I did do a little bit of analysis of other what other cities do. I, I always find that to be a useful exercise in terms of whatever mm -hmm. subject we're discussing. And, uh, you know, I would add to this analysis that we would be doing next year comparable analysis. I did find that Ames and Madison have an arrangement where their hourly employees based on the number of hours that they work, get a prorated health care package, kind of like city council does. So I mean, there are, there are nuances beyond you know, what we've discussed, uh, which potentially could lower the cost of this, this whole subject matter. So you know, I think it's a, it's a very complicated issue. OK, so this sounds like a friendly amendment yeah. to the way mm -hmm. Rockney expressed that, that idea. Yep. Yeah. So. Uh, are there f at least four people in agreement with that combination of things? Yes. Jeff, do you understand what we're yes. looking for here? Good deal. Thank you. Okay, our next item. Oh, well, we're still in the same item, aren't we? So are there other particular proposals that have to do with the, <coughs> the, the fiscal year 2020 budget? Uh, Jeff, you mentioned the Sanxay Gilmore House. I can provide the council with a very brief update about this. <laughs> Last week, Jeff and I met with President Harold at the university uh, to uh, explore, begin exploring the possibility of either us purchasing that house 
or somehow investing in the preservation and long-term preservation of that house while re retaining it in the university's ownership and other possibilities. I think we had a very fruitful meeting. My sense was that the president responded with, um, with interest. And uh, he's at, some, at one point, he basically said, um, well, as you know, well, I, I, I think I can say this uh, in all fairness. He said, we won't leave you in the lurch. And I, that, that, I understood that to mean they want to work with us, and therefore, I, I certainly found it to be a very fruitful and hopefully very constructive meeting. Uh, there will be further meetings that are related to this. Yeah, so beyond, with regard to the budget and the cost, I think we should just leave, what is it, 330 in there as a placeholder? It, if we eventually have to move it across the street, the cost will be higher if we choose to do that. One detail that I wanted to get, though, related to this, Jim, is we were going to get, I think, from um, Simon, an approximate uh, selling price, fair market value, because uh, we all got sticker shock. It's my understanding that it's going to be about potentially up to $2 million total, including the value of the parcel across the street, yeah. the moving costs, remodeling, et cetera, to move it across the street. And so I had asked Simon, what would the fair market value be with a historic landmark designation and no other restriction for the city just to sell it outright if we were to do that? Were we able to get that ballpark figure? Yeah, I have it. I have it handy. Okay. Uh, here, one second. I can. Uh... Well, Simon, if you've got it handy, you come up. Uh, oh, here it is. I'm going to go off of memory here, but the average was 470,000 yeah, for a projected sale price. I believe the range was roughly 430 to 516. I think was the high and low end of that range, and that's no historical designation and um, roughly the same land cost that's assessed for now. So you'd be looking at you're looking at 1.2 million roughly in rehab, moving in rehab okay. costs. If you want to factor in the cost of the land, which we already own, you're roughly at about a million. So you're right, two million, uh, give or take a little bit. And then based on comparable sales, and we worked with the city assessor uh, Simon did to to figure out what t what type of square footage uh, or what comparable apartments um, have sold for, and it's it's about 470 thousand was our best guess. So we'd be looking at approximately one. $1.6 million loss. Roughly. Okay. That's problematic. Okay, so uh, what I just ask you to do is stay tuned. There will be subsequent conversations, and I'll report back to you about it. Good. And <coughs> so on. All right, are there other particular items for the fiscal year 2020 budget? Well, yeah. well one that um, we, we did get some letters on this. Uh, that I, I would like to uh, ask for support is the form-based code for Northside Marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I do think uh, it's it's something that needs to be addressed now. Um, we've seen, I think, just in the last I want to say seven years, rezonings of three properties in the market Northside Marketplace area, the corner of Lynn Bloomington, and then the two northern corners at Lynn and Market. So we're we're seeing, you know, pressures, shall we say, for for that development uh, in that area. Northside Marketplace is is one of our more unique uh, commercial areas. Uh, it's one of our more beloved commercial areas. It's something that I think we need uh, to address. It also has impacts on some of the historic designations that have come before us. So what what I had said. Um, to those that I spoke with on this was, you know, the cost, I believe, of our consultant work for the North Side included the North Side neighborhood in addition to the uh, commercial area of North Side Marketplace. So I would, I would like to just focus for the time being on the commercial area and move forward on that um, in the next budget session. Um, I don't know if we have figures for what that might be. Um, 
I guess we would, the starting point would be looking at, at what the Opticos estimate would be, and then if we're not comfortable with that, I think we may want to consider uh, putting it out for an RFP for other consultants that could do the uh, work. Jeff, uh, do you have any idea what it might cost? Well, about a year ago, we had this conversation determining whether we go with the South District form based code or the, the North Side form based code. The North Side estimate was 275000 um, Now, that included the larger residential neighborhood, too. We didn't look at ever shrinking it up. Uh, council gave us the, the direction uh, to go with the South District, and you just approved that contract at, at your most recent meeting, I believe. Um, so I would guess you're still, if you go sole source with Opticos again, you pay a premium again to work with Opticos. Uh, you're probably you're, you're probably still going to be looking, you know, north of 150,000. I, I would guess even if you shrink it up there. A bigger concern for me is just our our staff capacity to manage two of these processes in addition to the the regular. Um, a flow of uh, planning reviews that we have to do. You know, our, our planning team is is pretty small, and to manage two contracts uh, like that would be a a tall ask for them. That was the question I was going to ask, and so I, yeah, I mean, I think we dealt with this a year ago, and I think I think it was a challenge for all of us at that time because we really wanted to do both, and wanted to do both of them as quick as possible, but ultimately decided that the south side would take precedence because that was basically greenfield and we wanted to get it done before that was all developed with a bunch of single family homes and it was basically too late and i think it was it was a combination of the money but also just staff capacity and so as much as i'd like to move forward with this now i think it needs to wait I just think that uh, it's it's important that we not lose sight of this because it's, oh, no. it's 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 such an important part of our community, and we keep talking about placeholders. And I, I would hope that I mean, 150 thousand doesn't sound like all that much compared to the monies we've been talking about this this afternoon. Uh, the time, staff time, yes, that, that should be taken yeah. into consideration. But it's just such an important part of our community and has so much historical value. And as John mentioned in the letter we received, got that you know they're already seeing the destruction of some of the older buildings, and it's sort of losing the whole vision of what the north side was kind of all about, uh, that warmth and, and uh, welcoming part of Iowa City. And I, I just think it's really important we not lose sight of it and, and put it somewhere at some point very soon in our budget. Yeah, I mean, my sense was when we talked about it last year was that we were going to try and move into this as soon as we got the south side done. I mean, it, we're going to try and go right into it because we felt they were both very important, but the combination of money, but maybe even more importantly, staff capability, you know, to, to manage the two contracts. One thing I, I think I heard staff say in the past is um, having these different form-based codes is uh, a little confusing, and so I'm not sure how that all, you know, plays in the mix. If there was a way to I, don't, I really don't understand the total process, but to combine them and then um, make it more simpler for, uh, you know, sections that are north side, south side. I just know that I heard them saying that it was very, um, it's becoming a little complicated, as well as for staff to explain it, um, where to look for specific things is getting a little confusing. So I'm not, I just wanted to bring that up because I, I know that it was mentioned here before us. Jim, I just have a question. I know we all really want to get into the benches topic. Would it be possible for us to defer this conversation until um, after? Because Maz and I have I one think we more. Can, I think we can finish this topic and oh, we, then move to the benches. Okay. All right. Cause, cause, so yeah. there's one more budget thing that Maz and I wanted to bring up, though. So um, my thought would be is I would like to do a work session, so we not a very long one, but a, a half hour, 45 minutes on this topic. I do think really what we're talking about with John is not really more than three to four blocks of area. There's really not that big of area in the North Market Square. So I would support that um, in terms of finding a way for a placeholder. I don't know whether we do a work session then modify it to a budget modification later. Um, but I think it's critical. And the thing is with waiting, my concern is, is there's a lot of projects potentially on the hopper, and we really need to get this done. So I would support that, but I'd also like to get a work session so we could more fully flesh this out so we're not feeling rushed. I'm okay with that. When do we have to vote on the budget? Uh, 
you'd really have to set the public hearing at your second meeting in February, just like you did with the assessor's budget. So you've okay. got one more regularly scheduled council meeting, and if you want to have more discussions, it's probably going to be special meetings. But we can do a modification afterward. I know we don't like to do that. We can do that, can't we? Yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah, you can amend. You can amend because your the other thing with here. Opticos, I love Opticos, but I don't know that we need the Cadillac. I mean, for crying out loud, prior to 1945, they made all of these naturally. So I'm hoping that we could evaluate that. So, yeah. Uh, all right. So, I would like to go back to some of the other items that we had talked about before and just get some clarification. Do, do you want to get this resolved first? Yeah. Okay. Seems Sorry, to me we should do that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what I'm understanding is that there is support, majority support, anyhow, for uh, and having a work session discussion about this, trying to find if it's decide whether we want to and whether it's possible to actually develop a form-based code for that immediate one block and maybe immediately around it. I'm not sure what the yes. boundaries would be. Uh, and, and that involves staff time. That involves the possibility of... Um, doing a request for proposals involving other firms, hopefully reducing the cost substantially. Yep. Can you clarify the timing of the work session? Are you trying to do this before the budget, or is this a post-budget issue? Uh, we could do post-budget, couldn't we, John? I mean, yeah. it, we could modify the budget. So the I'd say post-budget. That's all right with me if it's all right with you If it's just added to your yeah. pending list, then. Yeah. Sorry, Moss. Oh, no. Okay. All right, so I know you have <laughs> topics, but okay. would it be better to move to the benches given the, the timing bench. and given the interest people have, and then we can return okay. to That's this? That's fine. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to pick back up with the budget discussion after, probably after our work session, because Perfect. I think the discussion about the benches will take some time. So the next item on our work session agenda is um, clarification of agenda items. And one of the agenda items is communications. That's item 9A. There are, item, there are uh, quite a few communications, emails, and the like to us about the Ped Mall benches. So I think this would be an appropriate time to talk about that and try to become clear about what our intentions are and what our direction to the staff would be. I want to say just a little bit about that, just for background. N not a lot. I intend to say more during the, at the start of the community comment period uh, during our formal meeting. In this instance, I just want to get us to focus on the decision before us. <laughs> okay. So remember, we first encountered this topic in mid-December after we had learned about concerns being expressed on social media concerns about these new benches and how some of them, all of them, none of the new benches, all of the new benches had armrests in the center and therefore no one could lie down on them, especially homeless people. So that came to our attention. So we discussed that during our December 18 work session. And at that time, we instructed our city manager, Jeff, to report back to us about whether it is possible to install a meaningful fraction of benches at a reasonable cost. That's my translation of the direction, but I think it's very close. So Jeff's been collecting that information, and as directed, he has now provided us with a memo reporting what he found. And that memo appears in our information packet. I don't remember what the item number is in seven. that January 17th. Item seven mm -hmm. in the January 17th information packet. According to that memo, we can ensure that anywhere from 7 to 21 of all ped mall benches, that is 10 to 30 percent of all the benches, all in the whole ped mall, would have no armrests at a cost between $6,000 and $13,500. That's my condensed version of your memo, Jeff. You actually gave us an estimate about what it would cost to re make sure all of the benches do not have armrest, including replacing all the 35 or so that had previously been installed. And that was like $150,000 or thereabouts. So would you like to add any detail to what I just said about, uh, about your memo? No. Okay, so the question before us really is, do we want to A, replace all the benches that have been installed and then purchase new benches that would not have armrest, that would cost us about $150,000? 
do we want to replace none to, to have all the <laughs> all the benches have armrests and just proceed with what had originally been intended, or to have some meaningful fraction, like 10% or 20% or 30%, et cetera, of the, all the benches to not have armrests. Okay, and the cost goes up just a little bit, step by step, from 10% to 20% to 30%, until you get to the upper 40s, and then suddenly, bam, there's a tipping point, and the cost goes up a lot. So do you folks have preferences? Can I just ask a question before we make our preference? Sure. I want to ask, the 70 benches, all of them at the bed mall? Yes. Okay, and how many has been, like, really there right now? 33 have been installed. 37 are scheduled to be installed this, this upcoming construction season. My understanding that the 37 had not been purchased yet. Correct. Then uh, this means it's not going to cause us like additional money for the 37 because we can order them without arm. Correct. So if we looked at the same style bench without the center armrest, we would pay a, a little bit of a higher price. So we locked in our prices on the benches a year ago when we bid this. Now when our contractor has gone on to, gone back to the bench manufacturer to get that same bench without the ar armrest, we would pay a, a fraction uh, more. So, Can you tell me exactly how much more? Um, yes, I can. Uh, you have to do some quick quick math here because we have three different styles of benches. Uh, it would be seven thousand dollars for one of the styles, one thousand eight hundred and seventy three dollars and twenty cents for the second style of bench, one thousand two hundred and thirty eight dollars and forty cents uh, for the third style of bench. So roughly ten thousand, and that would for your for your phase two that would. Do all those benches, those 37 benches without that center armrest, those would all be located in the second phase. So as you can picture the completed ped mall, the benches that are installed right now with the armrest would all be where they're at now. And then between Blackhawk Mini Park and the two the two College Street wings would all have the the no arms. What we've suggested in the price, what the pricing reflects on the percentages, is that you'd probably want to intersperse those styles of benches. So, part of the part of the other costs that you see in the memo would be the labor to remove some of the existing benches that have been installed and replace, put those in phase two, and then put some of the new benches that would be coming in in the phase one area too. Now that means as five thousand nine hundred for uh, for four to take them out from there, right? To take them. Actually, we're not going to take the whole the whole thing because you're saying now thirty five, thirty three has been, you know, already on the bed mode, right? Half of this thirty three will be maybe taken from here to the to the phase two. Some and other, yeah. the new one that we're going to order, which is 37, we, will be without arm. So we can put like half of them here and half of them the other side. Correct. Uh, but how this is will make us pay 150 in this case. So because it, if you look at the memo, I'd key in on that. You know, you're looking at that 50-50 mark. That 47% is really that that tipping point, as, as the mayor uh, alluded to it. Once you get past that 47 percent, then some of the benches that we've already bought and installed, we no longer have a use for. We either have to put them somewhere else in the community, or we have to, to sell them um, because we don't, we don't have a use for them. That's why, that, that's why it jumps up so much after that number. You mean if we replace the whole benches? Correct. Yeah. That's why 47% is only 21,000, but if you want to replace all of them, it's 150, because all of a sudden we're buying 33 more benches than we anticipated at this outset of the project. Jeff, where do the benchmark benches fall into those numbers? Because those are the ones you'd said that, like the downtown district and maybe the painting project would continue. Are those included in those no so rail the, Our intention benches? with the existing benchmark benches, those are the painted benches, would be to continue to sell those. We've been selling those on our Gov deals. Uh, surplus um, auction site. The benches, uh, what the intention is with the Ped Mall plan is that we would continue that painting partnership with the Iowa City Downtown District, but it would be concentrated to the wing of the Ped Mall that's basically the library. Uh, <coughs> 
uh, uh, right. playground area there. And so the new benches that get installed in that area, they'd be brand new benches, but they would still be able to be painted on by the local artist. But it's a different style. It's, than a, it's the, a different style right, bench, right. yeah. Correct. Thank you. One on that particular issue, uh, one, one suggestion that, that I'm interested in putting forth is uh, keeping the existing benches which have been, that are currently part of the benchmark program. I think there are 17 benches out there now. Uh, and just simply uh, including them in, in the design of the ped mall so that we don't we, we would just simply be using those. We wouldn't need to order the full, uh, what Jeff was just saying, uh, 37 are to be purchased. We would need to pr purchase 20 rather than 37. Um, so there would, I suspect there would be a cost savings on that. The other, the other thing that um, supports using the existing benches is the, uh, the new benches, uh, the one that is, uh, is the, the, the bench that would replace the existing benchmark bench, uh, has a very wide gap between the, the seat and the back. It's the plain well bench, if you're familiar with the designs of the, the two bench types. So there, would, there wouldn't be the continuous surface uh, for the artwork to be incorporated on. Uh, so, so in that sense, uh, when, I, when I look at the existing benches, and see how well adapted they are to the benchmark program, uh, that combined with the fact that it would reduce the number of benches that we have to order. Um, I'm also sensing that uh, some of the comments I'm hearing from the community is they really like those benches. Uh, they are quite comfortable. Uh, so for, for a number of reasons, the last of which I will mention is the gap. Um, the gap, I was looking at this over the weekend, and in terms of the standards of the U.S. Access Board, which addresses issues of accessibility, um, one of their bench specifications is that the gap should not exceed two inches. And I haven't put in a tape measure to that gap, but I think it's roughly, I want to say about six inches. So. Um, and we we also received a letter from uh, from a resident who said that you know young children may have issues with that gap anyway in terms of you know possibly things falling through the gap whether it's stuff or their own bodies um, so so it seems to me that on a number of fronts as a starting point in this conversation anyway if we keep the existing benchmarks that we still have it should. They're, they're without a mid-arm, so they already satisfy that need. They could reduce the cost. I think they're better suited for the benchmark program. Uh, and they're comfortable and don't have the gap. Do you know how many of them there? 17. 17? Yeah, I, I really agree with you on that. Just I want to mention, when, when you're looking at the old benches and the new benches, the old benches is longer. And the, the new one, I guess, is a little shorter. And also, you know, the, 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 those are very, the, the old one is very comfortable. And even though it's just design on them, they look really nice. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree that we should keep them. How much would that cost, Jeff, if we just kept them? I mean, would there be a cancellation fee uh, associated with a, a change order? Scott, do you, Scott Sovers is the project engineer. Yeah, so I think there'd be a cost to remove and then reinstall the existing benches. So there's going to be an incremental cost there. The other thing that we probably want to keep in mind, too, is some of those benches are not in the greatest shape. Um, phase one, when we took some of those out, they basically fell apart. So we may have to take a look at which ones can actually be reused. So. But that would be a relatively minor cost in terms of the installation? I would think so. Would there be a cancellation fee in relation to the new ones that would have gone there? Yeah. I mean, it'd be, it'd be but that less. that would be a minimum, yeah. too. Yep. I think there is clear support within the community to retain some of the older benches. Perhaps we should do that. But, you know, I heard just what Scott said, and I had understood that some or maybe even all of the older benches aren't really in good enough condition to retain. But if they can be, I think there'd be clear community support for that. Mm -hmm. That said, uh, we still would need to consider whether to install some 
of the newly purchased, the, the, the pensions we're going to purchase to install some that don't have armrests in other parts of the mall so that there is dispersion throughout the mall. And I, I, my personal sense is that there's no need to have a large fraction of the, all the benches to, uh, to achieve that. I, my language is getting messed up here. I, I, I think somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of all the benches sh should be without armrests in the center. That seems to me to be in the ballpark and at a reasonable cost as well. And maybe by doing the, retaining some of the older benches, we can accomplish that more easily. So I, I, I don't know what you all think about that. So I thought, yeah, I thought 20% would be reasonable um, because the numbers were seven and seven, which is 14, and that, that seemed like a reasonable number. And then if we uh, retain some of the uh, original benchmark benches to add to those numbers, I would think that would that would be good, a good solution. One, one thing I'll, I would also add, you know, as, as I think most of you know, and I'm probably not most of the public, but, you know, this, is, this was the work that I did for many years, designing parks and open spaces. And, and the, way, the way I have viewed this issue, which um, has gotten so much response, is that it's, it's fundamentally a question of choice and providing opportunities, not just for the homeless, but for the entire population. And so the way, I, the way I've tried to evaluate this is what are the benefits of the mid-arm and what are the uh, disadvantages of having the mid-arm. And, and the mid-arm does affect more, you know, certain kinds of behaviors other than uh, stretching out. It's more than that. I mean, there are, you know, opportunities where you're sitting, if you're in a family with your child and the child, as we were saying, is, doesn't necessarily sit face forward. They can sprawl out. You have your stuff that you bring as a family. So in my view, the, the benches without arms are addressing a fair number of scenarios that one can see, especially around the play area, where you do have more likely larger groups and families which need to be accommodated with what we're providing. So another, what that translates to me is something, in terms of these percentages, um, something closer to 30%. I think, I think just replacing the existing, you know, reusing the existing benches would put us over 20%. On the other hand, the other thing pushing on me is I don't want to spend a lot of extra money on this project. So, you know, it's, it's, I think we may need a little bit more follow-up information, but um, I think we can have our cake and eat it too on this without adding a significant amount of cost to it. Well, I would hope we get to a point where we have clarity so that okay. the public understands what we've decided. I want to, don't want a lot of ambivalence about right. what we're doing. For me, I really think we need to do it like 50% because I always think <clears throat> all the people in this city, they pay for those benches. And by looking at the, all the emails and the people who say, yes, keep the armrest, and the people who say, no, don't keep them, I think we need to do it 50-50. All of them are taxpayer, and we, have to t we cannot satisfy everyone, but we try as much as we can to satisfy the public. So I think this should be 50-50 and will cost us around $21,000, which is reasonable for the mistake that had been done, so we didn't look to this closely, and maybe uh, that's what I really believe. 50, 50, 50 was armed, 50 was not, especially 21,000 is not that much for uh, just to satisfy our people who are paying for these benches. Just to be clear, I don't think we made a mistake. I think we have an opportunity to make a mid-course correction after having gotten some feedback from the public. I, I honor the public's views. We've gotten feedback. We're taking that into account. I don't think we made Okay, a I'm going to take out we. I made a mistake because I did not look at those benches when they, they uh, you know, put this plan for us forward. I did not look to them closely. Maybe if I did, I will really raise the concern. But I did not, and I think that's my mistake, and we need to do this. What I would like to see us do is if there are some of the current benches that are in good enough shape to be reused, I'd like to see us keep those. Um, I think there is a, a lot of interest in those. I, I think part of that interest is people 
maybe don't realize that the new benches are also going to be painted and are part of, you mm -hmm. know, part of the art project, which will, and so I think that may be part of the reason some people are speaking pretty strongly. But I do think the different design in terms of the comfort level and not having the gap in them, mm -hmm. um, for, especially for children, um, I think is a positive. Given that, and, and I guess depending upon how many of those um, are determined to be suitable for continued use, then what I would suggest is we we continue with the order of the others um, the way they're already set. I think what I guess frustrates me a little bit with this is I, I think I think what has has come up is is a solution to a problem that doesn't really exist. Um, when we look at the reports from, and nobody's really brought this up in the discussion, so I'm gonna get it out front and center. I mean, you talk to our police that are down there, we basically have no homeless people sleeping down there. Um, we've put millions of dollars and continue to, in terms of what I would consider to be real services to benefit the homeless um, and to be proud of having benches that they can sleep on. Um, I'm not proud of that. I, I want to do a whole lot better for our homeless, and that's what we are doing in this community. Um, but if we keep some of those that are reusable, um, I think that's a reasonable way to go. And, and I would also point, and most people have not seen this. I think some of the council members have had a chance to look at it, but it came in late today. Um, from Katie Gerlock with Shelter House. And I think when you start looking at these percentage of benches and you, you talk about the kind of service that you want to give, you know, with the prices that were in the staff memo, 10%, <coughs> roughly $6,000, that rent that is rent and utilities in a two-bedroom apartment for six months for a family of four. I'd rather spend that $6,000 helping that family of four uh, for six months than replacing 10% of the benches. 20% rent and utilities in a four bedroom home for six months for a family of seven. To me, that's a whole lot better use of $10,000 than replacing a few benches that people are not even sleeping on. 30% um, five households, single adult or family, help through rapid rehousing, rental assistance, security deposits, and rental payments, average of $3,000 per household. And there's more in here. Um, I think this is just a compelling argument that everybody should look at of where are we spending our money and how is it truly benefiting the homeless individuals. And to me, it is not in giving them a bench to sleep on. Um, a number of the homeless people have said they won't sleep down there because they, quite frankly, are scared to be down there when the bars let out because you have drunk people coming out of the bars that harass them, that steal their stuff. That is not where they want to be. I would also say equating conversations that this council had in 2013 with the discussions that we had in the past year with the redesign of the Ped Mall are two very different uh, two very different points in time and two very different sets of circumstances. We were dealing with synthetic drugs downtown, uh, which were causing a huge problem for the homeless and aggravating their behaviors. Um, since then, we've, we've put police downtown who have made great connections, handing out socks, underwear, referring individuals to assistance. Uh, we've opened up the winter shelter. We are doing truly beneficial things to these, for, for these individuals to help them and to connect them with services. And so benches, they're not on the top of my priority list, but I'm certainly willing to say, let's keep the ones that are there that are structurally sound and reusable, and then continue with the new ones. All right, I'm gonna get us to a decision. Yeah, I haven't had a Rather chance to comment yet. Yeah. yeah, but I'd like Please to, try to focus I would like to elucidate it. that, yeah. So, very quickly, I think really what we're dealing here with is a basic moral question, and that question is, is where do members of our community belong and are they welcome downtown? And I think what we're looking at is this bar is not only, we don't need, need to think about it only literally, but it's also a metaphor. I think our greatest fear is, is that downtown is becoming a gated community. 
And we don't want that. And we want to make sure that we demonstrate, literally, that everyone is welcome uh, in our downtown. Um, I agree with you, Susan. There were very complicated discussions that happened four years ago. I totally understand that, and I don't want to impugn those decisions that were made. I also agree with you that I do think, what do we say morally if we're saying that we as a city want you to sleep on the benches? I, I, I do think that is a legitimate issue. Um, I have, though, I work downtown. I do see people sleeping on the benches in, um, in dire circumstances. I've seen it multiple times. It continues to happen. It is an issue. So, to Jim, to your point, to sort of wrap up this issue, I would support 20% plus, which would be 20% of the, um, the replacement, plus to evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis the existing um, painted benches that we have down there, and then to also consider um, the remaining 10,000 that we would have done to get up to that 50% to do an additional contribution to Shelter House, a little bit beyond the, the conversation, but I think they have met, done terrific progress. Susan, you in particular have done wonderful progress on our, um, on our facility that we want to do for the Access Center. So that's where I am, 20 plus um, downtown. Uh, that sounds like a pretty reasonable suggestion to me. I don't know about the rest of you. I agree. Louis. Yeah, I, I do want to make a comment, and I, I know we want to move this along, but also take time to make sure that um, we've addressed the public. Um, I, I, I hear what uh, Rockney said. It really is, um, when we're talking about homeless people, we want to make, because that's how all this came about, we're talking about the homeless. Um, there's... Um, there's, we're definitely wanted to make sure that there's a place for them. Again, as Susan said, a, a bench in the Ped Mall isn't where I want to see the homeless. I would love to see us really figure out uh, sustainable solutions for people in our community that are homeless. And when we're talking about benches, I mean, it, it, our discussion be, should be different. In, in relationship in relationship to the homeless and and I heard someone you know talk about the data and Rockney I hear what you're saying that you've seen people downtown now there is a uh, some data where it's point in time data um, that is uh, conducted twice a year and that data came back with zero percent of people sleeping downtown at night um, in the ped mall so now I'm sure at times there are people down there at night. I think some of the um, individuals that are homeless, they do want to be where they're a shelter, where they can not be exposed to the elements, because if you're on the, on the bench, you know, you're exposed. So I think they choose uh, to go under bridges, where, as well as uh, places where their items can be safe and, and not exposed to the public. Personally, I am, I am not in favor of um, increasing the budget for the benches. I am more in favor of finding another solution where we can place money. If it has taken 5000 10000 whatever the case may be, to find, you know, put it towards something that will really go to the real issue and the real solutions, that's what I'm in favor of. 20%, 10%, 47%. For me, that is not addressing the real issue. And so I want to talk about the real issue. You know, and that's not what we're, we're talking about benches right now, but in the future, that's what I would like to address as the real issue. And so for me, um, supporting and putting more money towards the benches is not what I want to do. I, I agree with you, Bruce, because <clears throat> personally, I don't think we should have uh, people sleeping under the bridges, and we do. <clears throat> and on that point, I wanted to give kudos to our police department, because from what I've heard, when we're in these sub-zero temperatures, they go out and seek these people out under these bridges and get them to uh, the shelter house or, or, or our wet shelter. Uh, so they've done a marvelous job with that. But that's where we should be concerned. We shouldn't have these folks living under the bridges either. Well, I got to tell you, I don't understand where, I don't know where that leaves us because I'm hearing like six different perspectives. Okay. I, I think I just heard Bruce say he doesn't want to spend any more money. That's what I heard. And Maza I here wants to do 50 50. Pardon? I agree 20%. Oh, you well, he said no more money. 20% right, is I, more I money. I agree 20%. Oh, okay. So you okay. agree with I what agree Rockney with suggested? Okay. Originally, you're supposed to 30%, 30 percent, but I. John, have you expressed a view? Yeah, well, I, it, it would be roughly 30% is what I. Uh, the combination of. Yeah, a combination of, of reusing the existing and. An, it could be, as, would... could be as low as 20, could be as high as 20 plus another 17 benches, you know, all 17 of the existing 
paint um, paint mark. No, was it uh, benchmark, benchmark benches? But so they said this is not on good shape. How many of them are oh, in no, good well, shape? I'm, 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 I'm just going to give it a maximum. Go, so go. you're agreeing with me, John, correct? You're agreeing with me 20% plus evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, that yep. would probably translate. Can you just tell us how many benches in good of sh good yeah, shape? Yeah, in the original design, we didn't evaluate the the condition of these the existing benches, so we'll have to do that. So, I, right off the top of my head, I don't I don't know, but that's definitely something we can do. And, okay. and to be clear, the further part of Rockney's suggestion was ten thousand dollars to the shelter house to help with yes. their homeless activities. I mean, their activities uh, focused on homeless people. Do we have four for that? Are there four in favor of that? I'm in favor of that. John, I, think, I count one, I count two, I count three, That's fine. I count four. Yeah, I, I would just again want to say I, I am really not viewing this as it has been framed as a homeless issue, and the way I view it is choice for everyone, and that's the way we should be looking at the armrests. And it's mm -hmm. it's not simply the homeless who are impacted by the benches having a midarm. They're just it, there are restrictions. You're defining the space in a smaller increment. Exactly. Um, so I think it's really unfortunate that it's become so focused on one segment of the population that we're all concerned with, all doing a great job trying to address. This is a public space where we're talking about everyone of all different sizes and ages trying to be accommodated on the benches. Yeah, I'm, I I'm aware of quite a few people who actually like to lie down on benches. Yeah. <laughs> uh, some of them are really close to me, like myself. I mm. do that uh, periodically. So it's a good thing. A parent with child? You know. I do want to clarify. I, I, I uh, did not mention that I was in favor of keeping the 17 benches that are already there for that reason. And so it could accommodate everybody. Okay, I think we have a majority decision here. On the 10,000, do we? On the, we do on the 10,000 to shelter house as well? Well, uh, 10, I'm supportive. 10, 10, Are you in yes. supportive? Are you supportive? Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Five for that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay. Didn't say anything. All right, so it's about 20 till. Mayor, I, I just need some clarification. Sure. Um, <laughs> the 20% the figure, is that just the replacement figure or is that? Is that on top of saving as many benches as we can? 20 plus, so we save the 20, which is the option two, plus you evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis the existing painted benches. So it's like 14 new benches that do not have armrests, whether they be newly purchased or ones that we've just installed, right? You're tracking me there, Jeff? Yes. Plus, whatever number of the 17 existing paint mark benches can be saved because they're in good shape, then we would want to continue using them. Okay. Does, does council want to, do you want us to come back to you and do you want to place these benches? Do you want us to place them? <laughs> I'm, I'm serious about that because I wouldn't have very distinct styles of benches of and there's going to be a lot of focus it, on where, where the benchmarks go and where the new ones go. I, personally, I would, I would, my starting point would be <coughs> concentrating the restoration, the, the benchmarks in the vicinity of the children's play area. Mm -hmm. I think that's where they would have the most benefit for those reasons I was describing. I think it would also concentrate what I consider to be all the elements that we associate with Iowa City, namely, you know, the, the local art, the play area, uh, you know, that, that's down there for the children, the fountain, the library. These are all community-oriented, programmatic elements that are that share that part of the Ped Mall, and I think the benchmarks, you know, would be appropriate there. And in fact, the, that was the intent, I think, with the plan of concentrating them around the play area. I'd agree with John. Okay. Sound reasonable? Sounds reasonable. <coughs> All right. So let's continue to be reasonable and take a break. <laughs> Return to the work session after the formal meeting, and we'll pick up with our discussion about budget items. Uh, we were discussing the budget, and we had gone through three items. I think there may have been one or two other items that people wanted to bring up. So please do. Yeah, I wanted to... We kind of talked about a list of things and how much was going to be um, out of that 2.95 million, and then how much was going to be for the facility reserve. 
Um, and you had asked me, Jim, last time, kind of, you know, what I was thinking about in terms of I, without having really looked at all the numbers, I had said two million. Um, so I've got a couple things here as we go through these. We, as a majority, the council agreed to add 350,000 to the affordable housing budget above what the staff had recommended. When we did this last year, uh, similar thing, one of the things that we did was we made that contingent upon getting our full backfill from the state. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a very reasonable way to do that again this year. So that's my first point. Yeah, I don't know what others think. It's my understanding we're in a budget, better budget position than we were last year. I, I, Jeff knows this way better than I do, but that's my understanding. Yeah, these would these would be. I mean, our, our reserve surplus that we're working with was certainly larger than it was last year. We were more dependent on the backfill last year. That's accurate. And I think that that was a position that I had made that was already re defeated. Correct. I had made that exact proposal. I had wanted to do the oh. million contingent upon the backfill, so, and I think we already rejected that, didn't we? Oh, I don't recall discussing it. Okay. I, I don't recall oh, okay. that. This time, last time around we did. But. Well, that's what I thought I did, okay. but maybe I, I didn't. Well, I agree with you, Rockney. Yeah, well, <laughs> we got defeated, though, is the point. Two, <laughs> two. So, but I think the I, point is it's done. I, so I, I, I do. I think, I, I mean, I, again, we're talking about, you know, reserves. We're talking about other things that we need to do. So I, I, I guess I would throw that out. I think the 350 should be contingent on the backfill. Well, uh, are, are, is there a majority that supports what Susan's just recommended? I, I think I'd add one other thing. I think we're in a better financial position for, for the budget this year than we were, or for the forthcoming well, budget, than we were last year. So that's one thing. And so I, that kind of flips my concern. It, last year we had to do, make it on the, make the increase contingent. This time I think, okay, well, if we see we're going to be in a problem, we'll We'll cut wherever we need to cut. But I don't expect that to happen at all. Jeff, have we heard anything from the state legislators in terms of that? It doesn't seem like oh, I'm I, hearing I, as much about it. I fully um, expect it'll come up. It was nice that the governor's budget did, did fully okay. funded backfill. That was a that, that was uh, nice to see. But um, as priorities are, are bounced around in Des Moines, I, I, Pretty sure we'll see some of the okay. some of last year's proposals resurface. And again, they were negotiating something on the, the last day of the session last year that most people thought was going to get passed, and it fell apart uh, at the at the last hour. So I think it'll come up. Now, what we saw last year was a phase out. There wasn't uh, serious proposals to just cut us off, uh, but it'll probably be phased out over a period of two, three, five years. Okay. Then the other things um, that I had just to kind of confirm, I think, our agreements, we we had all agreed then to the 140000 for the South District housing um, right. that was basically coming out of that 2.95. Yeah. We just agreed that the 150000 for Delray is not going to come out Correct. of that 2.95. That's coming out of the land banking funds. We got 100000 for the solar at Terry Trueblood. We had agreed on 450000 to put the emergency re reserve back at $5 million. And so that would leave us with $1.91 million for the facility reserve, and that's what I would propose. I think that's the situation we're in, isn't it? So that, that's consistent with the decisions we've made, I think, so far. And, I, and Is that... All you have to say, yep. Susan? Okay. So following up on Muzzy here's discussions about contingency planning for unexpected expenses and opportunities that we have over the course of a year, um, one of the things that I wanted to evaluate is not necessarily an affordable housing addition fund per se, but that essentially we would set aside, we had a discussion with the LIHTC project a couple weeks ago, about $200,000 for um, additional affordable housing funding to allow greater density in that particular unit. That ultimately was rejected, um, but I think something Jeff had said sort of intrigued me, which would be there could be other more effective ways to utilize some of those affordable housing dollar funds. Um, and the second piece is, is for purposes of transportation. Um, transportation uh, has been a big topic of discussion. We've talked about adding Sunday bus service. I think we've made, in my view, the wise decision not to go forward with expanding Sunday bus service 
um, while we are um, in the process of doing the planning study. And so what I'd like to um, propose is that we um, evaluate possibly up to $200,000 that would be a council justice fund that we would be able to um, keep in reserve for the types of contingencies that we saw for our 150,000, whether it be affordable housing or transportation. Um, so wouldn't necessarily, um, that's something we would look at possibly um, proposing. So I don't know what people think about that or have it. Cause I think Maz brings up a really good point that we need to bring up contingency planning for our social justice needs. What are the opportunities that could come up throughout the year that we would then be able to tap this fund for this unexpected contingencies, whether it be in transportation or affordable housing. So for example, example, on Sunday bus service, one of the things I was hoping we would get would be a more particular proposal from either the public or maybe from staff about a possible interim solution involving vouchers. We don't have a well fleshed out policy for like a Sunday transportation policy, but this would give us some funding flexibility if we get the right proposal. And if we don't get the right proposal, then it would essentially just revert presumably into general funds. So um, that's what I would like to propose. With regard to your last point, uh, Rockney, I think I'm expecting to see something come to us. So why don't you say a little bit about that? Yeah, in the interim Sunday service, you had asked us to look at that as staff, and you also put a call out to the community if you have ideas. Um, North Liberty is currently working through a taxi service proposal, and uh, um, they've shared with us the proposal that they're they're working on, so we're, we're looking at that. And then uh, barring weather cancellations this week, I know our transportation services staff is having a meeting with Horizons that provide... Uh, uh, they provide uh, some Sunday and late night transportation services in Cedar Rapids. So we are exploring that. We're not in a position to come back and report, but both of those would be in uh, interim steps, I think, as you characterize it, knowing that the long term was going to be studied with this, this plan. And presumably there would be a cost associated with what that. What would the funding parameters of that be? Do we know? Well, um, I, I think we touched on this briefly during the Saturday budget work session. The transit fund currently operates at a surplus three, four hundred thousand a year, um, I believe roughly. Um, those are funds that we have been setting aside for federal match for facility replacement. Um, but we do have flexibility within that fund uh, to shift some of those over to operations uh, if, if needed. And then as we talked about before, if that subsidy were to come from the general fund, uh, we would either uh, tap our reserves or our contingency. And I just want to distinguish those. The, the reserves are kind of that safe savings account that, um, that that we keep from year you know year over year and then the contingency is the one percent uh, figure which is 580 I believe right now that that just comes up for the, uh, the that's what Dennis talked about earlier you know that's probably where we'll pay the, the ten thousand to shelter house just those unplanned expenses that come up will amend the budget and that contingency will shrink to cover those un unintended so there's a possibility of using those funds too yeah. I think, I think if we got 500 something in contingency, it would seem to me that that gives us an awful lot mm -hmm. to be able to use if there's something, mm -hmm. you know, that we real that really comes up that we really want to do. My concern is if you set a specific budget item for that amount, it becomes a target for everybody to want to spend. Mm -hmm. And maybe you don't. Also, maybe you don't end up making the best decisions because people just want to spend it. The other thing mm -hmm. that I think is really important that we keep in mind is we're going to have HCDC coming to us. Yeah. And I mean, their like their memo. Well, their memo said hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not saying that we're going to do that or that we'll feel we can do that, mm -hmm. but we also, in that regard, you already have. Nonprofit agencies doing a lot of really good work that I would say are justice work within yeah, the community. Crisis center. Um, that might be the first direction we would want to go. So to me, with already having that 580000 or whatever it is in the contingency, that 1%, and knowing the HCDC is coming to us, I would prefer to go that way. Okay. Yeah. I just want to mention, Jim, you told me earlier when I said the congen. I don't even pronounce how to pronounce that word, but the fund for five uh, five hundred eighty. When I said there is fund there, you clearly said this is fund just for like emergency. Unless we have a fire on the city or something like that, we're gonna use it. 
And now you're telling me we can use it for social justice fund? And we cannot use it for to give the city employee, uh, you know, benefit? I really don't understand. When I say something, you come up with something, and now they come up with something completely different. Why are you guys undermining me? Maz, and you I, saying something, I, I and they say something else. I haven't said a word with regard to this no, topic you said, right now. No, I'm talking about early. You said clearly. I'm going to go and look at the table and just record that for you. When I said there is 500, you said this is emergency. And this is only if like something like a fire come up on the city. We don't have to use it unless for emergency. That's what you said. And now those people, they say, no, that's fun. It's for, for everything. Maybe I can maybe I can help explain or distinguish those those two different things. When you're talking about using funds for salaries, now all of a sudden that's there's no there's not a contingency there because those funds are really earmarked not only for that year but for the next several years. So you've you've in, you've in fact shifted from a contingency model to an operational model. When we're talking about one-time funds, whether it's ten thousand to the shelter house or two hundred for uh, a to be determined opportunity, if any exist, those are one times. You know, particularly with that 200, you wouldn't necessarily be making that commitment for two, three, four years like you would with an employee. He salary. did not explain it that way. That was bothering me while I'm like, like proving my point and telling that. And you just shut me down by, oh, because I really don't know what that fund for. I never heard about it, and nobody told me about it. We never talk about it. But you really said that clearly. That made me feel like, oh, I'm really stupid. How come we're going to use something for really emergency for that? And now, when we said, OK, we need fund for justice, and for that, they start saying, oh, we have that money. We can use it for that. I, I guess what anyway. I would say is, I think Jim was using the emergency as an ex as an example, and and maybe no. please let me finish. And he, maybe with he changed it right now. He said you can use it here and you can use it there. <clears throat> what I was saying was I think Jim was using that as an example of something that we might use contingency for, and I can see where if somebody did not fully understand what a contingency fund is, they might misunderstand that. I would also say. I do not believe that as a one of seven council members that any one of us is making any attempt to undermine anything that you are doing or saying. There are going to be agreements and there are going to be disagreements in a council of seven. And we all have that opportunity to express them. I have not ever had any conversation with any of my fellow council members, nor have I ever felt myself that I was trying to do anything to undermine any other council member. I will disagree. I will express my views, as we all do, and we all should. That's what we're elected to do. But I don't feel that there is any effort to undermine any councilor sitting up here. I think though the Mazi I will always say what I feel, regardless you accept it or not. But I think, though, that only underscores the need to have something that is sort of not earmarked, but more generally, more guidance and focused in terms of a justice contingency um, in the transportation of the affordable housing areas. And maybe we could further develop that later on, but that's why I'm making that proposal. Do I have support for that proposal? I, I support what you propose. I hate to be disappointed again, but I support what you propose, and I think we need fund to be allocated there for, for like council justice fund to do whatever we want to do if it's something coming in the future. That what well, I believe. We do have something coming our way, as Susan noted. The Housing and, uh, and Community Development Commission is sending us recommendations to commit another roughly three hundred and fifty thousand dollars to a whole series of agencies that are doing very important work in this city. That's a new request for us to commit $350,000. Uh, I think we will take that request very seriously because they, these are really important agencies. Um, but we can't keep saying yes to everything that comes our way. We have to make judgments, and some people make certain judgments, other people make other judgments, and then we look for the number four or more. That's what make, determines what the decision is. 
I said what I see, and sure. that's the people can say. I always not can, don't get the board. That's fine. Maz, when we did, uh, when w the budget originally had six hundred fifty thousand dollars in it for affordable housing, you wanted one million dollars. What did we do? Uh, oh, I want it. No, you guys you, don't want it. You, you, no, Maz. You wanted us to put a million dollars into it, and we did. You uh, you always also propose something you want it, and we we will agree with you. Why not? I'm here just sometimes, like you guys. Sometimes yeah. and sometimes not. That is the way. Yeah, that's fine. Did I say works. something? I just said you don't have to tell me something. Is not like uh, really the whole information. You should tell me everything about the the fund. Not you say something that and to shut me down. So for me, the, the, you know, the proposal made by Rock, Rockney, the 200000 which can go for Council Justice Fund, Opportunity Fund, however we name it. I want to acknowledge this council um, efforts for affordable housing and the justice programs that we're already doing. A lot of them are not even in the... Um, not even in the, in the 2.5, 2.95 million that we're considering, and so for me, even though I I, I would love to support the 200,000, for me I, you know, say I would support it if there is counselors that would support it, but immediately if there is not four, I just, you know, draw that support back. For me, I think we've done it. We we're we've done some things. We. We'll love to do more, but I don't know that it's worth um, f pressing the issue from my perspective. I think, um, you know, the w w there's things that's going to come before us in the future. Um, you know, there's, of course, I, you know, I didn't really prefer that we use the land banking, but, you know, that's okay. We can you you know we can get to some of that stuff in the future. So, for me, the two hundred thousand justice fund. I think any projects that we want, whether there's a justice fund or not, we can bring it to the council. We can uh, present our case, and there's ways to fund it if that is something that we really want to do. So, for me, I don't know that I would push this issue. So we have. A th two people in favor of your recommendation so far and three people opposed. I don't know what John and Pauline think. From what I'm hearing, I think, mm -hmm. I think your concern of transportation and affordable housing, Seems we, have reserves, we have reserves in various locations where if something should arise, we can pull from it. I, I think, you know, I, I do believe this council has social justice issues at the forefront, so I'm, I'm not concerned that should something arise that we'll, we'll pay attention to it. So, so that's basically a no. No, no. All right. I'll, I'll, although I, I appreciate your sentiment and where it's coming from, I think over the past few years I've noticed that when there is something that we truly, really want and believe in, we've been able to, um, thanks to Dennis and, and other city staff, uh, to be able to figure out how we're going to fund it, and we have come up with that. And, and so I think we just continue that way we have and with what we have, although it's an excellent idea. Okay. Are there any other suggestions with regard to the budget? Okay, hearing none. Uh, the next item is clarification of agenda items. Of course, we've already gone through the agenda, but there, there was at least one thing I wanted to very briefly mention. Can I just suggest something? Sure. Because some people are waiting here for the food cart. Can we go jump there and come back to the rest of the agenda? Oh, okay. We could do that. I don't see why not. That I know people have been very patient, unbelievably patient, actually. <laughs> Good grief. Yeah, Still so let me, let me find where meetings, that is, right? Maz. Um, on my notes, anyhow. Uh, this would be in the information nine, packet nine, yeah. of the item nine of the January 19th, 17th? 17th. Information packet, right? Okay, I'm trying to get there. Item nine, item nine, it's down here somewhere. Like page 81. Yeah, no, I'm doing it differently. I'm looking at my own notes. Okay, yeah, so we, I know staff needs direction on this, so 
Simon, are you going to summarize what's being recommended? Absolutely. All right, please do. Um, first of all, uh, well, Simon Andrew, assistant to the city manager, uh, why this is becoming coming before you now is the current permits run through April 30th. Uh, so if we do want to change city code or revisit the program broadly, uh, we'll want to get the code change done by then. So that's why we're looking for direction now. Uh, to break down the recommendation into two separate pieces might make your decision a little bit easier. Uh, first piece of it is recommending extending the four current permits uh, through 2019, through December 22nd, 2019, which would uh, put it after the uh, fall semester graduation. So getting the full semester in for this year's business, um, that would not only give uh, us more time to react, but would also um, take into account the last phase of the Pedmall project. Uh, we found that last year during the Pedmall project, finding space for the four current vendors was very challenging. Uh, so that's the first piece of the recommendation. Uh, after that, uh, staff recommends that the program go way after uh, December 22nd of this year. Uh, the vending started on the Ped Mall many years ago. Uh, it was originally introduced as a, a venue for temporary vending. Uh, they were year-by-year -year permits. Uh, it wasn't all food vendors. It was uh, the goal of which to create a more vibrant streetscape downtown for more daytime vending options. Um, and initially, staff regulated uh, both the hours and menus of uh, food carts downtown. We would send staff out every afternoon to make sure that folks were uh, vending and make sure that their menus matched uh, what was on their application. Again, the goal of which to give more of that vibrant uh, streetscape feel. Uh, what we've seen in the intervening years, especially after we drew back from regulating hours and menus, um, we didn't uh, find that it was very efficient use of staff time to be going out there on a regular basis and citing vendors. Uh, we found that they uh, serve almost exclusively the late night bar crowd. Uh, and so it got very much away from the original intent of the program, uh, more of that uh, daytime um, the streetscape vibrancy and more uh, small business kind of get your foot in the door uh, type of temporary opportunities uh, to serving that bar crowd. Um, and we've found also in those intervening years that a number of changes city council has made to the use of public space downtown really gets more at those uh, original intents of the program, um, such as the street cafes. Uh, there are food trucks allowed uh, downtown, not on the Ped Mall or directly adjacent to it, but uh, certainly many more uh, vending opportunities in the intervening years. And so that was uh, the basis of staff's recommendation. Uh, we've dwindled from a peak of eight permits. Uh, we're down to four owned by two separate companies currently. Uh, and so at the close of this three-year permit cycle, uh, if we do intend to make changes, now's the time to do it uh, and uh, discuss that uh, before the April 30th deadline of the current permits running up. Uh, one other piece of background we used to uh, do these annually, and we used to have many more applicants than we had spots. Uh, and. Uh so it was really understood that this was year by year, that you were not guaranteed a spot next year. Uh, what we found was uh, in 2012, when we were going through that permit process, uh, the city was sued by one of the vendors who weren't, wasn't selected, uh, and we pulled seniority out of the decision-making process for reviewing applications. In exchange for pulling out seniority, um, recognizing that there are upfront costs to starting this business, uh, we went from a one-year to a three-year permit cycle. And we're very clear with vendors at that point that uh, there's no guarantee that after three years uh, you will have a spot that this is public space and city council may choose to go a different route with it uh, when they uh, wish to. Uh, so that's where we landed today. Uh, at the end of the day, um, not meeting the original intent of the program, um, some administrative costs that can be burdensome to staff, and also we want to see the Ped Mall clear out after the bars close and uh, not be policing folks waiting in line. There are a number of other rationale in that memo, and I'd be happy to answer. Sure. Does anybody want to ask Simon any questions? Simon, I'm not buying the public safety rationale. Mm -hmm. There's been one instance in which there's been a problem associated with standing in line. I mean, has there been any assaults? And do we have specific data? How much time extra are people congregating by reason of the food carts being present? Sure, sure. And I don't want to imply that there have been any... Uh, yeah 
public safety incidents directly related to the cards. Okay. I would say that it's more broader issue that um, the police officer policing the Ped Mall at 1.32 a.m. where there are hundreds of people around would prefer those groups to break off into smaller groups and either go home, go to restaurants, uh, go elsewhere and not be staying on the Ped Mall. But no, I don't have any specific data as to minutes or numbers of people, but um, I did speak to Chief Matherly about this and he echoed the same thing that, um, you know, we don't, we can't tie any specific incidents to this or nor would we want to, but in general, after the bars close, we want to see people Wouldn't go that home. then support us if we wanted to make, address that issue to essentially have the permit expire earlier? Like sure, and that's something that, that if we do want to continue the program, that is a change that um, I would recommend making. We do cut off the uh, food trucks, I believe, at 9 or 10 p.m., um, and that was the logic when we introduced the food truck program as well, is that um, and not having that congregation at bar close is uh, the most desirable. I would say that any one of the points in the memo can be corrected with a more minor code amendment. I would say that overall, in totality, um, really we're not meeting the intent of the program, and so therefore, um, I think we should revisit it broadly rather than uh, extending three-year three permits. How long is this food truck been going on? Uh, food carts on the pet oh, mall, uh, probably 20 years. I think that grilled cheese started late 90s, 2000? 20 years, 20 years. And during these 20 years, all the time, they will mostly use them after after they get out, I guess, from clubs. And they, yes, I guess, as the restaurant will be closed and they cannot find food, and they just go to this cart and buy food. I understand that the police have a concern about people staying there, like a lot of people, but have they done something like really problem there? Uh, is there a problem has been reported? Like Certainly, again, the, the problem in terms of that is not the food carts or their operations whatsoever. Um, and again, to Rockney's point, if we cut off the permits, say, at midnight, uh, then that concern does go away. Uh, it's, it's more broadly that we don't want um, hundreds of people on the pet mall after bar close. I and really don't think even to, oh, sorry, to cut it away will be like really solution because uh, most of their customer, I guess, will come after after the bar. That's, that's the time exactly they make money during right. that time. How come we're going to cut the hours? As long as it's not really creating problem. And uh, we just was talking about the, the um, we need like, uh, what's it called? Licensing kitchen for the people so they can cook there and sell their food. We are even trying to make like more food cart like, I guess, like at the Center for Worker Justice, we have a project, uh, it's called like, uh, do your small, like, I guess, own your small business or something like that, where uh, we will encourage people to just cook if they are really good on that and just do like sell their food through a food truck and something like that, food cart, I mean. And uh, what we are really asking the city manager even to do, I was trying to propose a licensing kitchen at the, you know, the, the recreation center, and after that we found out we can do it at the senior center. All this, why are we doing that? Because we want to encourage the community, the low-income people, to, to do that and just cook there and maybe sell their food. And Absolutely. And, and that was alluded to in the memo. What we haven't seen is this pro program being used by new startup small businesses uh, looking to get a foothold in the market. Uh, what we have seen is it's the same food carts year after year and not introducing a new business. I, I think that um, overall we've seen the most success with food carts with our temporary use permits. Uh, there is a, um, a Mexican restaurant on, the, on Highway 6, I believe, that started as a food cart and then became a brick-and-mortar uh -huh. location. Yes. We would like to see more of those temporary installations, the pop-ups, the, you know, starting out at festivals, things like that, rather than uh, the same uh, cart using the public space year after year. <coughs> but this is really coming down the road. I'm going to assure you, because at the Center for Worker Justice, we have a campaign, and we are doing that. We, we send all those people to the event that the city, I guess, Tracy Hyatt just had it at the Kirkwood Community College to teach the people 
people how they can open their businesses. And one of the options was a food cart. Mm -hmm. And all the people, they came there by all this idea, and they said, hey, they said we can start like small with a food cart. You know, we, we just like helping those people now to learn and to just, you know, uh, how to save money to budget this and everything. Absolutely. But it's coming on the way. That's why I, I really want to see this program continue. That's what I was going to ask Simon is what are we doing as, as, as a city to reach out to, to new businesses? Sure. How, how do they know that that's a, even a possibility? Sure, absolutely. That was a these. strong focus of the Building Business Basics. Uh, they get a lot of interest from folks looking, looking to start restaurants or food carts. Um, the, the main way that we see food carts throughout the city used outside of the ped mall vendors is through temporary use permits. So you'll see them in parking lots. You know, this is when somebody sells uh, produce, say, out of a truck, uh, sweet corn, that's a temporary use permit. Um, the uh, the Mexican restaurant that I mentioned started as a food cart uh, that operated, um, I believe, from hy vees parking lot, maybe. Um, but that uh, program will continue. And that's where we have seen some success with people starting new small businesses. You know, as we just noted, the, the grilled cheese cart has been on the ped mall for for, you know, 20 years, and uh, we haven't seen that being used by new businesses getting into the market, nor have we seen that move into a, a permanent location. So I think that there are better ways, whether it's the temporary use permit that we will still continue to have, uh, special events, other ways to to make that happen, uh, to encourage those small businesses. When, when we were uh, debating about having the um, food trucks, mm -hmm. we heard a lot from the brick and mortar restaurants, but I mean, to hear the that these food carts have been downtown for over 20 years, and and as to my knowledge, we haven't heard from any of these brick and mortar places. And how, how many of them are, are open even late night for for people to be able to get something? Because that's where I see is the advantage of it is that uh, it's it's uh, an affordable option for for people to grab food. And and uh, as a healthcare provider, if, if somebody's been drinking a lot of alcohol, I think you, we want them to eat something. We want them to have food to eat. And if there aren't any options, uh, then what are they supposed to do? So. Absolutely, we used to get much more pushback on this program from downtown businesses. Uh, we don't uh, in recent years, uh, as you noted, there aren't that many kitchens open past midnight. Uh, one uh, thing that was also alluded to in the memo uh, is a, more of a long-term concern uh, since we went to the eating drinking establishment 500-foot uh, rule is that uh, new restaurants coming into the downtown must choose to either serve alcohol and close at midnight or not serve alcohol and stay open till bar close. And so we've seen a couple of restaurants choose on either side of that uh, in recent years and the fear is that over time that incentive will be to close at midnight and sell alcohol. Uh, uh, those are the ones that we've witnessed staying open, whereas some of the ones that chose not to serve alcohol um, weren't able to survive. So I, know, I know there are other people who sure. want to speak to this topic. Uh, why don't we ask them if they want to come up and speak, and then if we need to ask Simon other questions, we can do that afterwards. Good evening. Good evening. What, what patience you have. Pretty astonishing. <laughs> hmm. The opportunity we didn't think we were going to do this at the work, work sessions. <laughs> you got to you gotta speak into the microphone. Yeah, so Please say your first name. I'm Mark Paterno your names, your with Marco's names. Grilled Cheese, George's Euros, Paco's Tacos. Yep. Uh, Pete Johnson, the same. So co-owners of Marco's okay. Grilled Cheese, George's Mr. Euros. So I just want to touch on, so when we started in 2000 with Marco's Grilled Cheese, the city had their requirements of uh, being out there during lunch and then certain nighttime hours, we always abided by those. We never wanted to get off that lunch. The, the, the city allocated a daytime spot and a nighttime spot, and we just pushed the cart to both. I don't know why, but on one end of the ped mall, they would buy at lunchtime, the customers. In the evening, they wouldn't. That's just how it worked. So when the city lifted that requirement to, um, to have to be out there during the day, they also decided only to give us one spot, so we didn't have that option of two anymore. We never wanted to stop lunches. In fact, I reach out to the city probably every year asking again, can we go back out to our old day spot um, so we can be out there during lunches and not lose money. It all boils down to losing money or not losing money. Our windows to make a living in this business, you know, <clears throat> we don't write the rules. We just have to react to the, to the truce are those busy rushes. I mean, that's that's just the way it is. Um, if you take that away, I mean, even at midnight, I mean, there's no, it's not feasible to, to survive on on two hours, you know, 8 p.m. To, to midnight 
I mean, we, we wouldn't have a chance. And we've tried the city, the city over the last 20 years. The city's moved. Um, the city has um, uh, managed offices. Tried, we've tried different things. We've been on Iowa Avenue. We've been on a couple different places. We tried over by kind of Joe's place in that area, and it just hasn't been the same. I mean, there's nothing that can replace that kind of rush of people that come out of those bars um, in the late night hours. And we're still very much out during the day. I mean, we still do arts fest, jazz fest. We do gay pride. We do um, uh, uh, concert after uh, sorry uh, concert series. Um, uh, we do any special event uh, basically that comes to town. So we're still very much out there during the day. We'd like to be out there for the uh, for the lunch crowd, but where we're at, uh, kind of in front of Brothers, is where we're kind of stationed right now. Is very much a bar scene with the patios that they've replaced, which I think are great. The restaurant patios, um, but that's that's taken whatever lunch business was in that area, which is pretty dead during the day. If you've ever walked down there, all it's better now with the patios. Um, is is just not enough business to justify being out there. So it's not that we don't want to do that. It's just that the uh, the, the, the revenue doesn't justify it. And if there are people down there, we're down there. You know, we're out there. If there are people there to buy food, we're out there. But um, just like any other business, I mean, it's you know, a lot of the restaurants aren't open Monday, Tuesday, Sunday. You know, for a reason. It's just there, there. There's no one there to sell food to. You know, so we can look pretty, um, but there's just not much. Uh, it's not. It's not survivable. Um, you know, it's still tough. And just to clarify, George's Euros was started by George Mihalopoulos in 1984. Prior to that, there was a popcorn cart. Do you guys remember that at all? So, I mean, we're, we're talking about 40 years, really, of food carts, or of carts, semi-permanent. And the popcorn cart, I remember, was kind of a permanent fixture. Yeah, and, um, the, and the reduction of permits has really been, that, that's not been at our behest. It's been, over time, the city has reduced those um, permits. And there was a time when you had so many people, um, you know, you had so many vendors kind of fighting over. It was a burden on the city, I think, for a while. But it's been many, many years since it's been that way. And the city, over time, has basically taken those opportunity a way of the opportunities you were talking about with the um, you know people coming in and starting businesses and moving to brick and mortar uh, type situations when you reduced it down to four and basically what we did just naturally through attrition these people retired we took we bought their business um, all, but the two the two other carts that we own besides Marco we simply bought because they were going to just throw them away so and the idea was out there we took it we bought it we didn't mean to have some kind of you know crazy monopoly on carts when they reduced the permits down to four it made it look like that um, so um, um, it wasn't necessarily something that, that we did. This was something that the city very much, over time, eliminated the permits and then took away the day spots. So it, that, that's why this memo is kind of frustrating to us because it's, it seems to say, well, this program is kind of disintegrated into this and it doesn't serve the original purpose. When in reality, the, you know, the the, uh, the city and I'm not throwing anybody under the bus. There's been multiple different um, city managers over time, have have kind of slowly but surely kind of whittled it away on their own, and, and we can't figure out why. And just to clarify, it went from five cards or per permits total in 2000 when we started, then they expanded to eight, and then they've since retracted back, they being the city. Yeah, and, and originally, as the plan was proposed to us, it was more of a, it was more as a create character and um, kind of a uniqueness to Iowa City. And you know, if you go to any city, my favorite's Philadelphia, where you have Philly cheesesteak sandwiches after at dark. Um, you know, a, a part of your city, you've got the day side character of your city, and then you've got, in my mind, every good city's got a, a vibrant nightlife with unique stuff, right? And food carts are always a part of that. Every time I go to Philly, I go and get a cheesesteak sandwich after after dark. And you know, I challenge you to find anybody in Philadelphia that doesn't think that that's a vibrant part of their culture. You know, that makes them unique. That makes them different than just kind of every other bland city out there. So, I, you know, I, I, to say that there's, uh, you know, we've we've kind of moved away from that, and there's really no purpose to it. To me, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I mean, it's you know, we're we're a 20-year. I mean, not to brag about us, but you go anywhere. Um, you know, I, I travel you know all over to airports all over the you know the world, and I wear my Marco shirt on purpose, and I see people come up to me and they're like, oh my God, I love Marcos. You know, it's amazing. That's awesome. You know, I was there in Marcos and Iowa City and hit Marcos every night after the bars for four years that I was there, you know. So this is really spread out as we've had, um, you know, 20 years of, of University of Iowa students coming through. We joke that we're now as old as the youngest, we're older than the youngest freshman coming in. Uh, to the university, and so um, that's gotten around, and, and so to say that that kind of means nothing was was kind of painful. To well, and didn't you guys start this in college too? Yeah, we were. I was a sophomore in college. Mark was a. I was senior. finishing. Yeah, he was okay. just finishing. So and you were undercapitalized, and this is a good opportunity to start yeah. a business with yeah. virtually nothing. Yeah, we borrowed seven thousand dollars from my parents at like ten percent interest, and, <laughs> <laughs> and we paid it back in our first year, which was amazing. So and we've always wanted to go to a brick and mortar uh, operation. You know, we just um, you know we just never knew whether 
whether it really, uh, whether this I, this concept could really support it. We'd love to do that. Mark still tries to talk me into it about every year, but um, um, and you never know. We may do it. We just copyright or uh, uh, trademarked Marcos uh, this year because a, a bar in um, Chicago. Uh, was selling the Marco's grilled cheese. It was an Iowa theme bar, and first I thought about sending them a cease and desist, but then I kind of realized it was a compliment more than anything. But um, uh, you know, I can't remember where I was going. I just lost my train of thought. But um, uh, anyway, yeah. I mean, to say that it's not, um, you know, it's it's not, uh, you know, a, a part of the Iowa City culture to me is not not seeing the whole picture. You know, and uh, Simon's argument about, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, we're somehow we're digging into the, you know, the, the bar's uh, food revenue, and because of that, they're opting to sell booze instead. To me, it doesn't really hold a whole lot of water because I mean, if you were to take all of our revenue, what we make, and I'm happy to show you what we make. Um, um, and div divvy it up amongst the 10 or 15 bars in there, we would barely pay a month's rent. I mean, we're just not, we're not cutting into them enough. You'd be better off taking Pancheros out, right? Pancheros and, um, you know, Jimmy John's um, and McDonald's as opposed to us. So um, that's a little bit perplexing. So, um, yeah, I've got, I mean, I could stand up here for four hours and explain this all to you. And I, I tried to get some of these points to you, too, but we just found out about this. We were kind of shocked mm -hmm. because we just found out about this Thursday night. I was on my way to a vacation with my family, and so I was kind of writing this up in hotel rooms and on, in the car on the way and talking to you guys at the same time. Um, so we, we haven't had a chance to kind of give you all the information here, but um, but I'm happy to answer any more questions, you know, that you guys I want to Thanks. chime in, too. Um, when the city went from one-year permits to three-year permits, I was never given any any indication that the program might stop. Um, Jan is who I was dealing with at the time, and really, I mean, I have all the all the letters and emails from her in the city, but I mean, it was it was simply a procedural change from one year to three years. We had no idea that that the program. I mean, there's always modifications to the program, and we've always adjusted to whatever the city has wanted, essentially. But we had never any indication that anybody might want to. And, kill the and, whole program. And to the contrary, we had been asked uh, to come in, which we, which we do on time to time. When we owned our taxi company, we owned Marco's Taxi as well, and we uh, the city would bring us in, and we, and we which we appreciate, would bring us in and, uh, you know, ask us, you know, what's the best way to do this? What's You guys have been doing this the longest. What's the best way to do this? And so they did the same thing when they were doing the big Ped Mall construction project. And so we came in and we, you know, we, we talked about, you know, power requirements and where the carts were going to be and all this stuff. So naturally, in our minds, we'd already been approved for the three years. They're asking us about the future of the Head mall and our place in it, you know, we're kind of thinking we have a place in it. So it was a, it was a huge shock to us when you know we got to the um, you know we got Thursday you know the call Thursday night that hey real sorry but you don't really fit the plan anymore. We're going to probably be done with you um, and uh, you know so we, which we didn't quite understand. So okay, well, I think we fully <clears throat> fully understand this is really important to you. So let us <laughs> let us talk about it yeah, and then sure. maybe we'll ask you questions again. Maybe we'll ask Simon. I don't know. So uh, who, who has a, a point of view here? I do. I, I would like to ask if, if at all possible, I, I, you know, I don't know this nighttime scene downtown. Uh, <laughs> oh, come on, John. Well, John. <laughs> and, and, you know, I know, I know oh, I'm really, on, it's a big thing that I'm missing. I, I get that. But, do it um, once. So I really would like to, I have not heard a word from the students on this issue. Uh, maybe you have. In, I think they have one. an opinion. Where are they? Yeah, so um, I was hoping to put an opinion hmm. out there, um, at least talking to students, um, seeing what their take on it is, because um, as they said, it was kind of a short notice Thursday to Tuesday, but um, at least talking to them. Um, generally speaking, obviously, I can't talk to everybody and anybody just in my network, but uh, a lot of people enjoy um, having that option downtown. Um, they value it a lot, and part of it could be the culture um, that when you think about Iowa City, you think about these local businesses and really placing inside the Ped Mall. Um, but then at the same time, I heard concerns regarding um, kind of what Pauline said uh, about if you don't have, let's say, carbs or food. Um, essentially, carbs and food help with uh, deterring some of the side effects with over drinking. So if any individual is drinking, um, that having um, those food options easy and accessible, that's hopefully going to deter some of those over-drinking consequences. Um, along with that, um, I think um, more of on a personal note, if you have more people, 
that creates more vigilance. Um, this uh, the idea, kind of like that Jane Jacobs said about eye on the street. Um, that when you have that visual aspect, that can deter um, some of those potential public safety concerns as well. Um, so kind of looking at it the other side, other perspective. Um, but generally speaking, um, I mean UISG, I know has put events in the past, uh, not events, but like a stand to help distribute pizza to kind of help with this dynamic of trying to um, help other students and individuals um, know to have carbohydrates when you're um, drinking and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, just to spin off on what Gustav just said, I want to introduce a couple thoughts <clears throat> um, that are clearly relevant. One is I'm not aware of any residents complaining about the food carts. You know, just maybe some residents are upset about them somehow, but I'm not aware of any complaints. Uh, I'm not aware of any businesses complaining about the food carts. If there are, I need to know that. And then conversely, I, I, I would anticipate that there would be an outcry if the carts go away. So that doesn't sound like a good mix of things to me. Just getting it out there is a you know, part of our conversation. I'm not only opposed to closing down the food carts, I actually think to your point, we need to look at expanding these vending opportunities and reevaluating this program. Because I think to Maz's point, I look at this as micro entrepreneurship. And the fact that you guys are now 40 somethings, I think only demonstrates <laughs> what we're hoping to achieve is that there will be a college student or one of the people that you know, Maz is working with or whomever that is gonna have this opportunity at micro entrepreneurship. Now, we are very aware of the structural costs of the brick and mortar. We would very much want to monitor it closely if we expanded it, uh, where we want to make sure it wouldn't adversely affect that. But to your point, if we're looking at the aggregate purchasing of these bricks and mortars, and we're looking at the impact of a food cart, we're talking about a relatively de minimis impact, especially with the time frames that we're talking about. So for me, I want to keep what we have now unchanged. And I also want to look at this concept of what we do during the day, because I do think we need to look at opportunities for micro-entrepreneurship, and most importantly, access to downtown. It's extremely expensive to access our downtown business market. A lot of the downtown bricks and mortars have earned that over time, and I don't want to take that away from it. I want to be very limited, but I think we need to look at that. So I would actually like to expand um, what we're doing. So maybe you guys would be mad at us, because we'll add competitors to you. Um, <laughs> But that's where I am at this point. I think for me, uh, of course, <laughs> being here for 25 years, went to the University of Iowa, and many of my friends come back, and you know, the places that they want to go is going to be Airliner, it's going to be the Vine, and it's going to be um, definite, definitely for some gyro. Uh, what they learn is sometimes <laughs> back then when they were drinking, you know, food was really, really good. Now they realize that one, they can't stomach some of the stuff <laughs> <laughs> like they used to, and then things probably wasn't that good, although your food is good. Um, <laughs> what I will say is this. Um, when we're talking about safety, -ish, safety um, any issues or complaints, um, I, you know, I even read about special events. I feel like all of that stuff can be resolved. Um, one of the things, and I, I, that's what I was going to talk about, is re-looking at this program. Um, because when I hear that we went from eight down to, five, down to four, is that correct? Yes. So with that, there is limited opportunity for other individuals. And so I think that that's something where um, whether we increase it and if we increase it, you know, let's say we increase it back to eight, um, we need to make considerations for, all right, if there is eight people that are all now, you know, interested, but there is a ninth person and we have four owner, we have one owner owning four things, how do we do that, you know, monopoly and, and, and make it, you know, give opportunity to people. So, I mean, I am willing to relook at this. I'm not saying eight is where we need to be. Um, I appreciate staff bringing this to us. Um, for me, you know, I, I don't know that I'm going to recommend making changes right now. 
Can I, can I make one, a, a couple uh, quick comments because I think it's important to get in front of uh, one, one issue in particular. We've scaled down intentionally. We've scaled, we, we started that strategy probably 2014, 2015, knowing that the Ped Mall construction was coming and knowing there would be constraints. So we haven't filled some of those permits because of that. We experienced some of that pinch point last year. We had a lot of conversations with food carts, our staff did, about placements because of construction displacement. And it's going to be another issue this coming year because the area that they want to be is going to be the one that's under construction. Um, it, it, you know, I'd encourage you if you if you want to f continue the program, that's great. We'll, we'll do it. We felt it was our obligation to come to you and say, this is an extremely in, uh, labor-intensive um, administrative. Uh, um, program to manage. Our staff that manages this is oftentimes frustrated and dealing with um, um, a lot of questions that come in, whether it's from neighboring businesses that have concerns about placements, about carts that want to shift placements, about carts that want dual placements and different. It gets a lot more um, intense than what it what it appears. You know, it sounds like it's just kind of on on auto. Um, it's not, and and that's why we're here talking about that. But if you all want to continue it, that's fine. We can do that. Um, as you look to expand the program, you can expect there's you're going to double down on some of those challenges. We we weren't, we aren't restricting things. Because we have the, we have something against food carts, it's because there's legitimate problems that come up, and and we've had trouble managing those problems. So I'm okay with I see I know where the sentiment is on this issue, and I'm okay with that. Um, but I just want you to know what our intent is all, all along. It sounds like we've been intentionally trying to slowly bleed and, and close this thing out. That's not the case. We were preparing for a construction progress process, uh, project, and then as we took a holistic look at this thing um, coming into the new permit cycle, we just said, look, there's concerns in four or five different areas. Maybe it's time to move on. Um, I really respect what you said. I understand it. But even that wasn't one of the reasons on your mama. And the thing that you just said right now, I don't see it in your mama. And I don't know why. I mean, if it's really important, it should be there, that the first thing. Second thing, I really think this is really important program. Even though now with the construction, you can find a way for them to do it because this is the, how long is going to be the construction there? It'll be all of next year. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Do you know where you're going to stand if with the construction? I guess. I think so. Yeah, I think so. And, and that, that's one thing. <laughs> if you're going to speak, you please come up to. Yeah. Them. So, so that and that that was kind of a big deal for us last year because we, you know, we had to we we had to go through that construction period. And anytime you have that, and you ask any of the bars around how that affected them as well. But, I mean, we went, you know, we went in the red. I mean, we drew on credit lines to get through that. It was one of our worst years, and we were fine with that, thinking that we had a future. Um, but then, then when we kind of made it all the way through that, spent all that money just trying to survive, um, being bottled in like that, which was fine. We understood it. You know, it's a better ped mall now for sure. But um, you know, uh, and then to get yanked at the very end, that that was tough to deal with. But I, I, you know, we're more than happy. And I told Jeff this in our in the, one of the meetings. We actually called a meeting to try to figure the, some of those things out that you're asking. I said, hey, if any major changes are coming down the pike where you're thinking about making changes to this program, um, you know, we're happy to come in. We'd like to be part of that conversation. And so that's why we're a little surprised to see this memo come out because nobody's nobody's brought any of these things to us. They haven't said anything about the security. They haven't said anything about these are the struggles that we're going to have. And we're happy to take the lead on that. I mean, we're happy to get there's and there's only two of us really there's um bon me and us so we're talking about two individuals right now and we'd be fine expanding that and if more people come into it you know we'd be happy to take the lead on that and uh you know make sure that this is an easier transition where they're not having to struggle so much with infighting between vendors a little bit of that did happen you know back in the the early st stages of the program when you had a lot of people and when they were regulating menus and stuff like that where people were getting angry that somebody was selling somebody else's food and so i can understand that last five to eight years, I mean, there's really been two people to work with here, so I don't know how much of a struggle two people, two parties uh, really could be. So, But we're happy to do anything, you know, that, that it would take to alleviate that if that's an issue, for sure. Okay, we could talk about this for a long time, yeah. but we don't Go want to. Go down and get some food. I think I hear a clear sentiment to continue the program. Yes. 
I think yes. I hear a desire on your part to work with the staff to try to resolve some of these staff administrative kinds of issues. Without a doubt. Am I missing something? I what think I think the only other thing potentially is in the next three years, with them being renewed, is at some point in that time to have maybe more conversation at the council level and with staff about do we expand, do we not? What are some of the drawbacks? You know, with the changes in the Ped Mall, can we do we really have room for more than four? So I think just having those conversations before we get to the to the end of that three. Just okay. one final note I just want to make. Uh, when I first heard it, I thought, well, three of the four are the same owner. But hearing your story tonight, I, I want to commend you because, uh, you know, to pick up those ones that were just going to disappear, you know, then we would have only had two. And then, then I might have some second thoughts about this. Is it worthwhile to have it? But I but I see you as very respectable business and, and uh, providing a safe, healthy food. So Thank you. Yeah, that's very kind. That's all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think, you know, it's pretty damn late. And so we need to finish this discussion. I think we have two topics we need to address. One is the traffic collision analysis. I think that'll take just a few minutes. <laughs> I thought I'd word. inject a little humor there. And the other is the uh, proposed resolution about the labor center. So let's get the traffic collision analysis out of the way first. And so that's the IP number eight. The staff desires direction on this. Uh, it's a very interesting report. I hope you all have read it. There's a lot of detail in there about where collisions occur most frequently at intersections and in mid-block. And it's, it's clearly almost entirely about Highway 1, Highway 6, Riverside. Well, Riverside Drive is Highway 6, isn't it? And, and Mormon, a little bit on Mormon track, you know, but mainly Highway 1 and Highway 6. Uh, so what do you need from us, Kent? Good evening, Kent Ralston, train station planner, uh, MPO director as well. So yeah, briefly, um, it, I don't know that we need anything from you, to be honest. Um, that question remains. But you know, we've done this analysis for the entire metro area as part of the MPO for a number of years. This was specifically asked for by the council as part of your strategic plan, um, just for Iowa City for the years 2015 through 2017. As you mentioned, Mr. Mayor, you know, primarily where you see the high collision corridors are where the most vehicles are. It's just it's just logical. Um, what we do with it in turn is staff takes this and actually looks into the top rated collision areas and sees what kind of countermeasures we can use and employ and trying to lessen the number of collisions. In a nutshell, that's what we do. Um, that said, I don't know that we need anything from you. I think it was to make sure that you all had what you needed as part of your strategic plan. And then I think as part of one of the pending work session uh, items, there was a sort of a to be a joint meeting, I think, between uh, Dr. Plummer, I think Plummer. it was Plummer, I'm not yeah. sure, um, from the university as well as an update on on this. Um, that said, I'm, if there's nothing else the council needs, staff will continue on regardless, and I'm sure you have other things to uh, discuss at work sessions. Yeah, so I'd like to suggest that staff reach out to Professor Plummer uh, so that she can participate in a work session discussion about this. She can provide us with an update on her research and, and participate in our conversation. It seems to me it'd be best to do this in February or March. Yes. So if we can shoot for that, that'd be great. Try to get her on board. I, I just have a couple of comments that I'd, I'd like to make. Um, you know, I think it's, it is interesting to see this. This is, this is sort of at the, you know, the highway scale aspects of our transportation systems. Um, you know, nine of the 10 highest ranking streets are all state designated. Um, so that's sort of, it's sort of at the meta level in, in that regard. Um, there, and there isn't really any discussion that I could see regarding pedestrian and bike safety. This was really about tra car, car on car collisions. Right, right. What it, and what it does is it looks at every intersection and mid-block in the municipal boundaries that have three or more collisions. Right. We choose three or more because it's right. a pattern, so to speak. So, so you know, I, I would emphasize, and I think this is where Professor Plummert comes in. You know, her her focus is on pedestrian safety, particularly with regard to children, because of their their different 
cognitive abilities and how that affects their their ability to safely interface with with traffic. Um, so I think that should, I mean, all of these streets that we've identified, which tend to be corridors uh, with, with high traffic, typically I would say they're, they're streets with uh, more than one lane in each direction, basically, which is one of the big issues that we face um, because of the, what that does in terms of um, accelerating traffic. That um, if, if possible, it seems like it would be really useful to have that pedestrian and bicycle aspect yeah. factored into this because the, all of these corridors are basically major barriers to anyone walking or bicycling. You know, the, the, the folks living south of Highway 6, you know, that's a problem, you know. Right. We don't have interstates, but we have, uh, meaning, you know, freeways running through our city, but these state highways are the next worst thing. Yeah, so, so um, yeah, so we, we looked at bicycle and pedestrian data, and we have that collision data. The issue with that data is, while there may be 100 bicycle accidents last year, the thing is, is that that number's so small, and the accidents are so sporadically sort of dispersed around around the city, is that there's no real trend. Um, what you'll see, of course, just like we see on the major highways is where we see our, our high accident locations for vehicles. The downtown sort of grid area, which is also uh, you know, shared with the University of Iowa, is where we see most of the bicycle accidents. But again, when you have one or two here and there sort of sporadically dispersed around the community, it's hard for us to sort of react to that and try and find a solution to it. Well, I guess my feeling is, is you may not find data at the level of a collision, mm -hmm. but these intersections that occur along these corridors are unsafe, for be, partly because we know the traffic flows and their speeds, uh, you know, the, the volumes sure. and their speeds are going to have an impact on pedestrians and bicyclists, that we would want to consider how to address those intersections along these corridors, if sure. possible. And then the, the other- John, John, I don't want to cut you off, but can I please- Well, one, I had one more comment, okay. Okay, but you know, we're gonna revisit this topic in another- Well, in terms of preparing for this meeting, I just wanted okay. to mention- Be brief, please. Yeah, um, in terms of the potential <laughs> countermeasures, I just, I was a little bit flabbergasted to see that under roadway design inadequacies, widening the lanes was one of the remedies. I mean, hmm. so I'll just leave it at that. Um, there are 50 some odd, of, you know, in Speck's new book, about half of them relate to speed. Right. That, that's the core issue. It is the core issue. The so. one thing I would say, uh, and I sort of hold this back from time to time, but is that, you know, for every, um, for every request I'd say that we get in our office for slowing traffic and calming traffic, we probably get an equal number of requests for folks wanting to remove parking and sure. increase speeds and um, coordinate signal cycles so they can drive faster. So, you know, we've got this push-pull in our office, but certainly, I mean, safety is the key element. There. Safety. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. Jim, I just want to quickly thank Simon for providing us with all that data, because the, the numbers certainly weren't very surprising, but I think okay. It, okay. It, it, it does. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And so. you'll, that report will be part of our uh, the discussion we have in several weeks, right? Definitely. Thank you. Thank you for your patience, too. Okay, let's turn to item uh, IP number six the, on the January 17th information packet, the proposed resolution submitted by Mazza here about the U of I Labor Center. So let me begin by stating a fact, and uh, I'm gonna get into it by saying I was brought up a Catholic. So for those of you who know what Catholics do, they make confession. And so when you walk into confession, this is literally true, you go behind a door, there's a priest behind a screen, <laughs> it's all dark, and then you say, Father, forgive me for I have sinned. It's been, I don't know, 27 years since my last confession, <laughs> and uh, I must admit, and this is what I'm gonna tell you, we had a discussion many, no, not many, a few months ago about the Labor Center, and you directed me to write a letter to the president about it, expressing our view and our support for the Labor Center. I did not do that. And I didn't do it, I did not do it, first because I was swamped with other stuff at, right after the meeting. Secondly, 
time passed, I forgot. Thirdly, I thought the decision was already resolved and time, more time had already passed. None of those are good excuses, but it is a fact. So now we have a proposal to do a, um, a resolution. And I want to suggest a, a different procedure. I mean, I understand the motivation. Uh, we could either issue a, um, um, I could either read a proclamation which conveys the essence of what we want to say, or I can really write a letter and really send it. I don't think a resolution would be, be, the, be the appropriate thing, but if we write a, if we do either a proclamation or a letter, I think it's really important that we not explicitly criticize the president of the university or tell him what to do. Partly because I personally have to work with the president of the university on several topics of mutual interest to the university and the city of Iowa City. And I don't want, I think it's really not wise to disrupt that relationship. Um, uh, moreover, we're not an advocacy organization. We are one of many governmental units in the city. So what I would like to suggest is that we either have me read a proclamation or write a letter that expresses all the things we admire about what the Labor Center has done, all sorts of positive information about the Labor Center but then not, not do the other things I mentioned. Yeah, and so. you said why is not resolution? Well, a resolution is a particular um, um, tool we can use. It, 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 one of you could help me on this. What's the formal rationale for issuing a resolution versus a proclamation, Eleanor? Well, for one thing, a proclamation, we read proclamations without a vote of the city council. Mm -hmm. um, so they can be submitted and read. Um, a resolution is something that is voted on by the city council. Um, so the city council is going to have to, everybody's going to have to agree, or four of you are going to have to agree with that mm -hmm. for it to pass. Um, resolutions are typically, I mean, you can use them for all sorts of things, and we do use them for all sorts of things. They tend to be more to make something happen that you have control over, to approve a contract, um, to put a policy in place, that kind of thing. But it, it can be used for this purpose if that's something that the council wants to vote on. I, okay. I, I do want to do a resolution, and here's why. Um, that the proclamation is just sort of a statement by the mayor that does not represent our judgment as a body. It does mm -hmm. not reflect our view uh, to this, the University of Iowa president as to what should happen to the Labor Center. Um, I agree with you 98% of the time we are different bodies. We want to tread very carefully with our other partners. And there's no greater partner in the city of Iowa City than the University of Iowa, which we love, you know, go Hawks, right? Um, but this is such a critical issue. I mean, I'm very passionate about it, not just because I have enormous respect for everyone, but I literally think that lives are on the line if they close. I'm serious. I think sexual harassment is on the line if they close. I think training, the training that the labor center does is absolutely critical for safety education, labor enforcement, working conditions that they train throughout the state. And so the fact that this could be closed, I think, would not only impact direct community members that are part of labor movements and even just everyone who has a job, but I think people throughout the state. And I know it makes them feel uncomfortable, and I know potentially he may feel uncomfortable, but I think given the fact that they've made the decision to make us feel uncomfortable and unsecure and unsafe and a lot of our residents unsafe, we need to do the resolution. It will make them uncomfortable, but we all sit here in a very comfortable position as upper middle class people that are not directly beneficiaries of this, um, at least directly. So I think we have to do it, and, and if you decide it's unwise policy, you can vote no. You know, we could have a divided council on this, but I think we need to stand and support it. 
Yeah. My uh, preference is, I mean, we decided a few months ago, I think we talked about a resolution at that point in time and a letter, and the decision at that point was the letter. So while it didn't get done, I would suggest that we go back and do what we had previously decided, and that is the letter. Uh, and I, I agree with that. And I mean, it's common knowledge that I, uh, I'm a union member and have been for over 20 years. I've also actually been a supporter of uh, organized labor for over 35 years. And during that time, I've come to know the Labor Center staff and seen firsthand the benefits of the education they provide. Uh, uh, it's much more than just about unions, as, as Rockney had hinted about it. It's about the health, safety, and well-being. Uh, of every working individual uh, in, in the state, as well as folks come from all around the Midwest to take classes there. And it's also beneficial to the employer. Um, but it, what we need to do to point out, I don't think we need a lot of rhetoric. I, as I told you, I think very well written, um, Mazi here, but I think it, it is lengthy and it doesn't really get the point across uh, the feeling that, that we have that we, we urge them uh, to, to support, the, that we support the Labor Center and we urge them to, to reconsider their decisions about uh, uh, the furloughs and uh, the decreased funding. So, but I just, I don't think we need a lot of rhetoric as in, as in a very long resolution, but I am supportive of the Labor Center and supportive of, of us saying something to the university about it. I really support the resolution, and uh, to your point, Jim, that we work with the university. The, we work, yes, we work with the university, and the, like we need the university, and the university need us too. We are not like starting like fight or demanding them. Hey, if you don't like uh, make the labor center, leave the labor center open, that means the city of Iowa City is not going to do any work with you. No, we are not saying. We just laying our value that what we see. We you know the labor center has been helping a lot of people, improving the life of a lot of people in this community. Our, com our city is growing. We have a lot of refugees. We have a lot of immigrants coming in. The Labor Center being teaching classes about the right and workplace, discrimination, wake theft, every single thing, really, you know, they've been providing that. And I think resolution will be strong. At the same time, it's not like saying anything that uh, give them the impression that, hey, we want you to do that. If not, we are not like doing anything with you anymore. No. We just laying our value. And even if at the end of the day, if they decide to close the labor center, we're still going to work with the university. You know, this is have nothing to do with like really, uh, you know, like uh, making that relationship bad or anything. And by the way, if you don't know, the student government uh, is really passing the resolution by like 77%. They also encourage the, the the university to do the same thing, and I guess we should do it. Yeah, just to make sure I'm clear about this. I, I don't have any objection whatsoever to issuing a document. It could be a resolution, it could be a proclamation, it could be a letter expressing how mu how much we value the labor center and what good work they have done. I'm just saying, I personally don't think it's wise to explicitly call out the president and criticize him and tell him what to do. I think that's a mistake. But expressing all the things we value about the Labor Center, which implicitly says support the Labor Center, you know, I think that's a wiser thing to do. So I wanted to mention that, yes, U.S. student government uh, passed a resolution because the Labor Center has been doing some, some amazing things. Um, I just wanted to also mention or that um, recognize that um, the appropriations with the fund, so if uh, a resolution or whatever is done um, that recognizes that this problem results from appropriations um, and that um, also potentially talk to graduate students because graduate students, through the funding model, um, graduate students are the ones that are being paid since I'm not personally representing graduate students. We, we've had that discussion. But yeah. I, resolution letter. I, when I look at this, I, I immediately think about things within the road of disability um, where the city of Iowa City could have came and said some things to the East Central Region, said some things to the state of Iowa that impacts local agencies personally. I, I think a letter 
would do it, a resolution would do it. I, I'm not exactly sure, um, you know, it's an argument over letter versus resolution. And it sounds like people are saying a resolution is more um, strong. Um, I'm, I am hesitant to, you know, um, give anything to the university that would be, you know, very demanding. Although I'm not um, hesitant to, you know, sh um, give a give something to the university um, in support of the labor center. I don't I, personally I, letter resolution as long as we get the point across. So you agree with the resolution then? Oh, yeah. what, if, what, if Jim well, were to, what if Jim were then <laughs> to write the resolution to take away some of the, the language that you had objection to? So you indicated that you weren't an objection to it. So that way you could speak as a body and you would be, be, be more diplomatic so you wouldn't have that concern. you got to keep me on board with regard to this. I, I'm happy to do that, but, but I will be traveling tomorrow okay. and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and then come back on Sunday. So... This is the same thing that happened the last time. I got swamped with some other stuff, and then, you know, time passed. So I'm not trying to excuse myself. It's just a fact. Or you could just excise the parts that you, you don't see, want. like, yeah. can you tell us which one is not? Oh, well. Um, I don't, I'd prefer uh, not to yeah. get into that yeah. level of yeah, detail at this point. Yeah, it's a lot of detail. Okay, I, can I you, support, are we going to hear it from you, John? Yeah, I support the resolution. I think it's best It's uh, for the council to basically be the, the voice. Uh, and I think Jim should massage it. I think he would do a great job. It would also be consistent with the student government if they issued a resolution. So I think I think the resolution is the way to go. Mm -hmm. And we're sort of, okay. we have some material here. It just needs to be, I think, condensed and... I don't know if there's anyone else on the council that would look at the resolution and give, recommend something to the mayor for a revision. I'd be happy to. If you want to do it. I'll channel you, Jim, and I'll make it diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me? No, I, I will. That's it. It's okay with me. Okay. And then we will collectively look at it. It's a resolution. We'll vote on it. Yeah. All right. Uh, uh, it may well be that we should stop unless somebody has something incredibly important I concur. to bring up. The only thing I would like to do is maybe, of course, not talk about it now, but definitely in the future from the 17th uh, information packet, we got the... Um, Construction. Um, from MPO, Kent sent something. Is it... It's in the 10th, the regional transit. It's in the 10th. It's in the oh, 10th. the regional transit, yes. Yeah. I really want to say um, IP4. We, if we can just talk about that in the future, we'll put. I'll just re, we can repost yeah. that in the packet. That'd Thank you. And then you'll. And are you gonna talk about the 17? Back in item number 10, I just have one question about that. Sure. You know the regulation of construction activity. I remember the woman who come here and complain about that, and uh, I, I read on the memo and they said that. There has been like the city has been receiving like many complaints about the same thing. I guess my question would be, what was the result of the complaint receiving regarding noise due to the construction activity? Uh, I really would like to know that because we need. I'd say we have. This. I'd say we have very few complaints. I think that's what we were trying to convey in the memo that there's only a, a few complaints per year that we get on the yeah. issue. Okay, and what's the result of that? Like, did you reach out to those people who complain, or you just received the complaint and that's it? Did be no, we, we, we'll talk with them. We'll explain the rules and regulations, and if we need to, we can reach out to the contractor and try to make sure it, it, either the contractor is working within the bounds of those rules, or at least they know that there's a concern, even if it is operating within the rules. So we, we try our best to uh, mediate. And nothing is going to be done about this, right? Not without your direction. I don't know that no, they, from my perspective yeah. there isn't anything that needs to be I done. Don't know, I, I don't okay. think there's anything that I guess, needs to be done. Uh, so when I, there Just is something has been done, yeah. I respond to them. Make sure you, they receive something. Okay. Yeah. I think that's it. Huh? Council listening post. We don't need to talk about oh, that tonight. The KXIC, there's we? time to. <laughs> well, we need to book it, a room. Yeah, what, what? we need to book the room. Monday, uh, oh, what? February 11th from 530 to 7. Oh. When? At the February IFU. the 11th. What's she saying? February 11th? We just need two the council members. February 11th. Where? The Monday. I am you in the oh. Black Box the Theater. Post. Oh, I said I, I am going to that one, right? 
Because that's what going. we would have I eaten could go if no one else well, wants I to wanted go. to con I confirm. I think it was Maza and... Find someone else wants to go. Was it wrapped? Was it? It might have been. Go. As that's long fine. as that date still works. Because at that the time... If you just send oh, your does that date work for you? No. Monday is not good. Uh, I know they were pretty tight room-wise at the IMU. I mean, I can at what time? 5.30 to 7.00. I think I can go, yeah. That's Monday, February 11th? Mm -hmm. Okay. What about the KXIC schedule? Um, I can Is repost that, that if somebody wants to take February 6th, so yeah, we just that'll have be that before, one. Our yeah. before our next meeting. Yeah. Okay. Any volunteer for February the 6th? <laughs> Staff will do it. <laughs> well, wow, there's there's yeah. an answer to that question. Okay, staff's yeah, going to do February the 6th. Yeah, yeah, Steve and I are done. Okay. Yeah. 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 okay, I think we're leaving. It's a, <laughs> it's a done thing. I object anymore.